section 44 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1. Edited by Arthur L. Hayward. The Life of Captain John Massey, Who Died for Piracy. The gentleman of whom we are now to speak though he suffered for piracy, was a man of another turn of mind than any of whom we have hitherto had occasion to mention. Captain John Massey was of a family I need not dwell on, since he hath at present two brothers living, who make a considerable figure in their respective professions. This unhappy person had a natural vivacity in his temper, which sometimes rose to such a height that his relations took it for a degree of madness. They, therefore, hoping by compliance with his humors to bring him to a better sense of things, sent him into the army then in Flanders, under the command of Duke of Marlborough, and there he assisted at the several sieges were undertaken by the Confederate army after his arrival, viz. Mons, Douai, Bouchain, and several others. Yet, though he was bold there, even to temerity, he never received so much as one wound through the whole course of the war, in which, after the siege of Lille, he commanded as a lieutenant, and that with great reputation. On his return into England, he at first wholly addicted himself to a religious, sober life, his several accidents of the war being disposed him to a more serious temper by making him plainly perceive the hand of providence in protecting and destroying according as its wisdom seeth fit. But after a short stay in London, he unhappily fell into the acquaintance of a lewd woman, who so besotted him that he really intended to marry her if the regiments going to Ireland had not prevented it. But there the case was not much mended, since Captain Massey gave too much way to the debaucheries generally practiced in that nation. On his coming back from thence, by the recommendation of the Duke of Chandois, he was made by the Royal African Company a lieutenant colonel in their service, and an engineer for erecting a fort on the coast of Africa. He promised himself great advantage and a very honorable support from this employment, but he and the soldiers under his command, being very ill, used by the person who commanded the ship in which he went over, being denied their proportion of provisions, and in all other respects, treated with much indignity, it made a great impression on Captain Massey's mind, who could not bear to see numbers of those poor creatures perish, not only without temporal necessities, but wanting also the assistance of a divine in their last moments. For the chaplain of the ship remained behind in the Maderas, on a foresight, perhaps, of the miseries he should have suffered in the voyage. In this miserable condition were things when the captain and his soldiers came into the river Gambia where the designed fort was to be built. Here the water was so bad that the poor wretches, already in the most dreadful condition, were many of them deprived of life a few days after they were on shore. The captain was excessively troubled at the sight of their misfortunes, and too easily, in hopes of relieving them, gave way to the persuasion of a captain of a lighter vessel than his own, who arrived in that port and persuaded him to turn pirate rather than let his men starve. After repeated solicitations, Captain Massey and his men went on board this ship, and having their tolerable good provisions, soon picked up their strength and took some very considerable prizes. At the plundering of these, Massey was confused and amazed, not knowing well what to do, for though he was glad to see his men have meat, Yet it gave him great trouble when he reflected on the methods by which they acquired it. In this disconsolate state, his night was often so troublesome to him as his days, for, as he himself said, 
he seldom shut his eyes but he dreamt that he was sailing in a ship to the gallows with several others round him after a considerable space the ship putting into the island of jamaica for a necessary supply of water and provision he made his escape to the governor and gave him such information that he took several vessels thereby but not being easy there he desired leave of sir nicholas laws to return home sir nicholas gave him letters of recommendation but notwithstanding those he no sooner returned in england but he was apprehended and committed for piracy soon after which he was bailed but the persons who became security growing uneasy he surrendered in their discharge soon after which he was tried convicted and condemned during the space he remained in prison under condemnation he behaved with so much gravity piety and composedness as surprised all who saw him many of whom were inclined to think his case hard no mercy was to be had and as he did not expect it so false hopes never troubled his repose but as death was to cut him off from the world so he beforehand retired all the affections from thence and thought of nothing but that state whither he was going in his passage to execution he pointed to the african house said they have used me severely but i pray god prosper and bless them in all their undertakings mr nicholson of st sepulchre attended him in his last moments just before he died he read the following speech to the people good people i beg of you to pray for my departing soul i likewise pray god to forgive all the evidences that swore against me as i do from my heart i challenge all the world to say i ever did a dishonorable act or anything unlike a gentleman but what might be common to all young fellows in this age this was surely a rash action but i did not designedly turn pirate i am sorry for it and i wish it were in my power to make amends to the honorable african company for what they have lost by my means i likewise declare upon the word of a dying man that i never once thought of molesting his grace the duke of chandois although it has been maliciously reported that i always went with two loaded pistols to dispatch his grace as for the duke i was always while living devoted to his service for his good offices done unto me and i humbly beg almighty god that he would be pleased to pour down his blessings upon his good family good people once more i beg of you to pray for my departing soul i desire my dying words to be printed as for the truth and sincerity of it i sign them as a man departing this world john massey after he had pronounced these words he signified it as his last request that neither his wife nor any of his relations might see his body after it was in the coffin then praying a few moments to himself he submitted to his fate being at the time of his death twenty-eight years old he suffered at high water mark execution dock on the twenty-sixth of july seventeen twenty three his unhappy death being universally pitied this was captain george lowther a redoubtable pirate a more complete story of Massey's adventures is given in Johnson's History of the Pirates. In Leadenhall Street, along which he would pass on the way to Wapping. End of section 44. Section 45 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1. Edited by Arthur L. Hayward. Section 45. THE LIFE OF PHILIP ROCHE, A PIRATE, ETC. As in the life of Captain Massey, my readers cannot but take notice of those great evils into which men are brought by over-forwardness and inconsideration. So, in the life of the malefactor we are now to speak of, they will discern what a prodigious pitch of wickedness 
rapine, and cruelty human nature is capable of reaching unto when people abandon themselves to a desire of living after their own wicked inclinations without considering the injuries they do others while they gratify their own lusts and sensual pleasures. Philip Roche was the son of a person of the same name in Ireland. His father gave him all the education his narrow circumstances would permit, which extended, however, to reading and writing a tolerable good hand, after which he sent him to sea. Philip was a lad of ingenious parts, and instead of forgetting, as many do, all they have learnt, he, on the contrary, took all imaginable care to perfect himself in whatsoever he had but a slight notion of before he went to sea. He made abundance of coasting voyages about his native island, went once or twice to Barbados, and, being a saving and industrious young fellow, picked up money enough to become first mate in a trading vessel to Nantes in France, by which being suffered to buy goods himself, he got considerably, and was in a fair way to attaining as great a fortune as he could reasonably expect. But this slow method of getting money did by no means satisfy Roche. He was resolved to grow rich at once, and not wait till much labor and many voyages had made him so. When men once form to themselves such designs, it is not long before they find companions fit for their purpose. Roche soon met with one Neil, a fisherman of no education, barbarous but very daring, a fellow who had all the qualities that could conspire to make a dangerous villain, and who had already inured himself to the commission of whatever was black or bloody, not only without remorse, but without reluctance. Neil recommended him to one Pierce Cullen, as a proper associate in those designs they were contriving, for this Cullen, as Neil informed him, was a fellow of principles and qualifications much like himself, but had somewhat a better capacity for executing them, and, with Neil, had been concerned in sinking a ship, after insuring her both in London and Amsterdam. But Providence had disappointed them in the success of their wicked design, for Cullen, having been known, or at least suspected, of doing such a thing before, those with whom they had insured at London, instead of their paying the money, caused him to be seized and brought to a trial, which demolished all their schemes for cheating insurance offices. Cullen brought in his brother to their confederacy, and after abundance of solicitation, induced Wise to come in likewise. The project they had formed was to seize some light ship, and turn pirates in her, conceiving it no difficult matter afterwards to obtain a stronger vessel and one better fitted for their purpose. The ship they pitched on to execute this, their villainous purpose, was that of Peter Tartu, a Frenchman of a very generous disposition, who, on Roche and his companions telling him a melancholy story, readily entertained them, and, perceiving Roche was an experienced sailor, he entrusted him upon any occasion, with the care and command of the ship. Having done so one night, himself and the chief mate with the rest of the French who were on board went to rest, except a man and a boy, whom Roche commanded to go up and furl the sails. He then called the rest of his Irish associates to him upon the quarter-deck. There, Roche, perceiving that Francis Wise began to relent, and, fearing he should persuade others in the same measures, he told them that if every Irishman on board did not assist in destroying the French, and put him and Cullen in a capacity of retrieving the losses they had had at sea, they would treat whoever hesitated in obeying them with as little mercy as they did the Frenchmen. But if they would all assist, they should all fare alike and have a share in the booty." Upon this the action began, and two of them, running up after the Frenchman and boy, one tossed the lad by the arm into the water, and the other, driving the man down upon the deck, he there had his brains dashed out by Roche and his companions. They fell next upon those who were retired to their rest, some of whom, upon the shrieks of the man and boy who were murdered, rising hastily out of their beds, 
and running up upon deck to see what occasioned those dismal noises, were murdered themselves before they well knew where they were. The mate and the captain were next brought up, and Roche went immediately to binding them together, in order to toss them overboard, as had been consulted. "'Twas in vain for poor Tartuffe to plead the kindness he had done them all, and particularly Roche. They were deaf to all sentiments, either of gratitude or pity, and, though the poor men entreated only so much time as to say their prayers and recommend themselves to God, yet the villains, though they could be under no apprehensions, having already murdered all the rest of the men, would not even yield to this, but Cullen hastened Roche in binding them back to back to toss them at once into the sea. Then, hurrying down into the cabin, they tapped a little barrel of rum to make themselves good cheer, and laughed at the cries of the two poor drowned men, whom they distinctly heard calling upon God, until their voices and their breaths were lost in the waves. After having drunk and eaten their fill, with as much mirth and jollity as if they had been at a feast, they began to plunder the vessel, breaking open the chests and taking out of them what they thought proper. Then to drinking they went again, pleasing themselves with the barbarous expedition which they resolved to undertake as soon as they could get a ship proper to carry them into the West Indies, intending there to follow the example the buccaneers had set them, and rob and plunder all who fell into their hands. From these villainies in intention, the present state of their affairs called upon them to make some provision for their immediate safety. They turned, therefore, into the channel, and putting the ship into Portsmouth, there got her new painted, and then sailed for Amsterdam, Roche being unanimously recognized their captain, and all of them promising faithfully to submit to him, through the course of their future expeditions. On their arrival in Holland, they had the ship a second time new painted, and thinking themselves now safe from all discovery, began to sell off Captain Tartui's cargo as fast as they could. No sooner had they completed this, but getting one Mr. Annesley to freight them with goods to England, himself also going as a passenger, they resolved with themselves to make prize of him and his effects, as they had also done with the French captain. Mr. Annesley, poor man, little dreaming of their design, came on board as soon as the wind served, and the next night, a brisk gale blowing, they tore him suddenly out of his bed and tossed him over. Roche and Cullen being with others in the great cabin, he swam round and round the ship, called out to them, and told them they should freely have all his goods if they would take him in and save his life, for he had friends and fortunes enough in England to make up that loss. But his entreaties were all vain to a set of wretches who had long ago abandoned all sentiments of humor and mercy. They therefore caroused as usual, and after sharing the booty, steered the vessel for England." Some information of their villainies had by that time reached thither, so that upon a letter being stopped at the post office, which Roche, as soon as they had landed, had written to his wife, a messenger was immediately sent down, who brought Philip up in custody. Being brought to the council table, and there examined, he absolutely denied either that himself was Philip Roche, or that he knew of any one of that name. But his letters under his own hand to his wife being produced, he was not able any longer to stand in that falsehood. Yet those in authority, knowing that there was not legal proof sufficient to bring these abominable men to justice, offered Roche his life, provided he gave such information that they might be able to apprehend and convict any three of his companions more wicked than himself but he was so far from complying therewith that he suffered those of his crew who were taken to perish in custody rather than become an evidence against them. This was the fate of Neil, who perished of want in the Marshall Sea, having in vain petitioned for a trunk in which was a large quantity of money, 
clothes and other things to a considerable value which had been seized in ireland by virtue of a warrant from the lord justice of that kingdom on the account of the detention of which while he perished for want of necessaries and clothes neil most heavily complained forgetting that these very things were the plunder of those unhappy persons whom they had so barbarously murdered after having received so much kindness and civility from them in the meanwhile roche being confined in newgate went constantly to the chapel and appeared of so obliging a temper that many persuaded themselves he could not be guilty of the bloody crimes laid to his charge and taking advantage of these kind thoughts of theirs he framed a new story in defence of himself he said that there happened a quarrel on board the ship between an irishman and a frenchman and that tartu taking part with his own nation threatened to lash the irishman severely though he was not in any way in the wrong this he pretended begat a general quarrel between the two nations and the irish being the stronger they overpowered and threw the french overboard in the heat of their anger without considering what they did throughout the whole time he lay in newgate he very much delighted himself with the exercise of his pen continually writing upon one subject or other and often assisting his fellow prisoners in writing letters or whatever else they wanted in that kind when he was told that neil who died in the martial sea gushed out at all parts of his body with wood so that before he expired he was as if he had been dipped in gore roche replied it was a just judgment that he who had always lived in blood should die covered with it some time afterwards being told that one of his companions had poisoned himself he said alas that so evil an end should follow so evil a life for his part he would suffer providence to take its course with him and rather die the most ignominious death than to his other crimes add that of self-murder the rest who had been apprehended dying one by one in the same dreadful condition with neil that is with the blood gushing from every part of their body which looked so much like a judgment that all who saw it were amazed he roche began to think himself perfectly safe after the death of his companions supposing that now there was nobody to bear any testimony against him and therefore instead of appearing in any way dismayed he most earnestly desired the speedy approach of an admiralty sessions it was not long before it happened and when he found what evidence would be produced against him he appeared much less solicitous about his trial than anybody in his condition would have been expected to be for he very well knew it was impossible for them to prove him guilty of the murders and as impossible for him to be acquitted of the piracy after receiving sentence of death he declared himself a papist and said that he could no longer comply with the service of the church of england and come to the chapel he did not however think that he was in any danger of death but supposed that the promises which had been made him on this first examination would now take place and prevent the execution of his sentence when therefore the messenger returned from hanover and brought an express order that he should die he appeared exceedingly moved thereat and without reflecting at all on the horrid and barbarous treatment with which he had used others he could not forbear complaining of the great hardship he suffered in being put into the death warrant after a promise had been made him of life though nothing is more certain than that he never performed any part of those conditions upon which it was to have taken place at the place of execution he was so faint confused and in such a consternation that he could not speak either to the people or to those who were nearer at hand dying with the greatest marks of dejection and confusion that could possibly be seen in any criminal whatever he was about thirty years old at the time of his execution which was at high water mark execution dock on the fourteenth of august seventeen twenty three End of section forty five.
Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 46 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward. Section 46. The Life of Humphrey Angier, a Highwayman and Footpad. From the life of Roche, the course of those papers from which I extract these accounts leads me to mention this criminal, that the deaths of malefactors may not only terrify those who behold them dying, but also posterity, who, by hearing their crimes and the event which they brought on, may avoid falling into the one for fear of feeling the other. Humphrey Angier was by birth of the Kingdom of Ireland, his father being a man in very ordinary circumstances in a little town a few miles distant from Dublin. As soon as this son was able to do anything, he sent him to the city of Cork, and there bound him apprentice to a cooper. His behavior while an apprentice was so bad that his master utterly despaired to do any good with him, and therefore was not sorry that he ran away from him. However, he found a way to vex him sufficiently, for he got into a crew of loose fellows, which so far frightened the old cooper that he was at a considerable expense to hire persons to watch his house for the four years that Angier loitered about that city. At last, his father even took him from thence and brought him over into England, where he left him at full liberty to do what he thought fit, resolving with himself that if his son would take to ill courses, it should be where the fame of his villainies might not reflect upon him and his family. He was now near eighteen years of age, and being in some fear that some persons whom he had wronged might bring him into danger, he listed himself in the king's service, and went down with a new raised regiment into Scotland, where he hoped to make something by plundering the inhabitants, it being in the time of the rebellion. But he did not succeed very well there, and on his return fell into the company of William Deuce, whom we have mentioned before. His conversation soon seduced him to follow the same course of life, and that their intimacy might be the more strongly knit, he married Deuce's sister. Then, engaging himself with all that gang, he committed abundance of robberies in their company, but was far from falling into that barbarous manner of beating the passengers, which was grown customary and habitual to Meade, Butler, and some others of his and Deuce's companions. Angier told a particular story of them, which made a very great impression upon him, and cannot but give my readers of an idea of that horrible spirit which inspired those wretches. Mead and Butler came one evening to him, very full of their exploits and the good luck they had had. Mead particularly, having related every circumstance which had happened since their last parting, said that amongst others whom they had robbed, they met a smooth-faced shoemaker who said he was just married and going home to his friends. They persuaded him to turn out of the road to look in the hedge for a bird's nest, whither he was no sooner got, but they bound, gagged, and robbed him, and afterwards turning back, barbarously clapped a pistol to his head and shot out his brains. After this, Angier declared he would never drink in the company of Mead, and when Butler sometimes talked after the same manner, he used to reprove him by telling him that cruelty was no courage, at which Butler and some of his companions sometimes laughed, and told him he had singular notions of courage. After this, he and his wife, Deuce's sister, set up a little alehouse by Charing Cross, which, soon against his will, though not without his consent, became a bawdy house, 
a receptacle for thieves, etc. This sort of company rendered his house so suspicious and so obnoxious to the magistrates for the city of Westminster that he quickly found the necessity of moving from thence. He then went and set up a brandy shop, where the same people came, though as he pretended much to his dissatisfaction. While he kept the alehouse, there were two odd accidents befell him, which brought him for the first time to Newgate. It happened that while he was out one day, a Dutch woman picked up a gentleman and brought him to Angier's house, where, while he was asleep, she picked his pocket and left him. For this, Angier and his maid were taken up and tried at the old bailey. He was also at the same time tried for another offence, viz. an Irish woman coming to his house and drinking pretty hard there. He at last carried her upstairs and, throwing her upon a bed, pretended a great affection for her person. But his wife coming in and pretending to be jealous of the woman, pulled her off the bed and in so doing picked her pocket of four guineas. But of this there being no direct evidence against him, he was also acquitted. However, it ruined his house and credit, and drove him upon what was too much his inclination, the taking money by force upon the road. He now got into an acquaintance with Carrick, Carroll, Locke, Kelly, and many others of that stamp, with whom he committed several villainies, but always pretending to be above picking pockets, which, he said, was practiced by none of their crew but Hugh Kelly, who was a very dexterous fellow in his way. However, when Angier was in custody, abundance of people applied to him to help them to their gold watches, snuff-boxes, etc. But as he told them, so he persisted in it always, that he knew nothing of the matter, and, Kelly being gone over into America and there settled, there was no hopes of getting any of them again. One evening... He and Milksop, one of his companions, being upon the road to St. Albans, a little on this side of it, met a gentleman's coach, and in it a young man and two ladies. They immediately called to the coachman to stop, but he, neglecting to obey their summons, they knocked him off from the box, having first prevented him from whipping off by shooting one of his horses. They then dragged him under the coach, which running over him, hurt him exceedingly, and even endangered his life. Then they robbed the young gentlemen and the ladies of whatever they had about them valuable, using them very rudely and stripping things off them in a very harsh and cruel way. Angier excused this by saying, at the time he did it, he was much in liquor. In the beginning of the year twenty, Angier, who had so long escaped punishment for the offences which he had committed, was very near suffering for one in which he had not the least hand. For a person of qualities coachman being robbed of a watch and some money, a woman of the town whom Angier and one of his companions had much abused, was thereupon taken up, having attempted to pawn the fellow's watch after he had advertised it. She played the hypocrite very dexterously upon her apprehension, and said that the robbery was not committed by her, but that Angier, Armstrong, and another young man were the persons who took it, and by her help they were seized and committed to Newgate. At the ensuing sessions the woman swore roundly against them, but the fellow being more tender, and some circumstances of their innocence plainly appearing, they were acquitted by the jury, and that very justly in this case, in which they had no hand. During the time he lay under sentence, he behaved himself with much penitence for another offence, always calling earnestly to God for his assistance and grace to comfort him under those heavy sorrows which his follies and crimes had so justly brought upon him. At the place of execution, he did not appear at all terrified at death, but submitted to it with the same resignation which, for a long space, he had professed since his being under confinement. Immediately before he suffered, 
he recollected his spirits and spoke in the following terms to that crowd which always attends on such melancholy occasions. Good people, I see many of you here assembled to behold my wretched end. I hope it will induce you to avoid those evils which have brought me hither. Some time before my being last taken up, I had formed within myself most steady purposes of amendment, which it is a great comfort to me, even here that I never broke them, having lived at Henley upon Thames, both with a good reputation and in a manner which deserved it. I heartily forgive, and I hope God would do the same to Dyer, whose evidence hath taken away my life. I hope he will make a good use of that time which the price of my blood and that of others has procured him. I heartily desire pardon of all whom I have injured, and declare that in the several robberies I have committed, I have been always careful to avoid committing any murder. After this, he adjusted the rope about his own neck, and submitted to that sentence which the law directed, being at that time about twenty-nine years of age. He suffered on the ninth of September, 1723. End of section 46. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 47 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed Volume 1 Edited by Arthur L. Hayward Section 47 The Life of Captain Stanley, a Murderer There cannot be a greater misfortune than to want education except it be the having a bad one. The minds of young persons are generally compared to paper on which we may write whatever we think fit, but if it be once blurred and blotted with improper characters, it becomes much harder to impress proper sentiments thereon, because those which were first there must be totally erased. This seems to have been too much the case with the unhappy person of whom the thread of these narrations requires that I should speak, namely, Captain Stanley. This unhappy young gentleman was the son of an officer in the army who married the sister of Mr. Palmer of Deuce Hill in Essex, where she was brought to bed of this unfortunate son, John, in the year 1698. The first rudiments he received were those of cruelty and blood, his father, at five years old, often parrying and thrusting him with a sword, pricking him himself, and encouraging other officers to play with him in the same manner, so that his boy, as old Stanley phrased it, might never be afraid of a point, a wretched method of bringing up a child, and which was highly likely to produce the sad end he came to. He served afterwards in the army with his father in Spain and Portugal, where he suffered hardships enough, but they did not very much affect him, who acquired by his hopeful education so savage a temper as to delight in nothing so much as trampling on the dead carcasses in the fields after an engagement. Returning into England with his father, old Stanley had the misfortune to stab a near relation of my lord Newbury's in the tilt-yard, for which he was committed prisoner to Newgate. Afterwards, being released and commanded into Ireland, he carried over with him this son John, and procured for him an ensign's commission in a regiment there. Poor young Stanley's sprightly temper gained him abundance of acquaintance, and, if it be not to profane the name, of friends amongst the young rakes in Ireland, some of whom were persons of very great quality, and had such an affection for him as to continue their visits, and relieve his necessities when under his last misfortunes in Newgate. But, such company involving him at that time in expenses, he was no way able to support, 
he was obliged shortly to part for ready money with his ensign's commission, which gave his father great pain and uneasiness. Not long after, he came again into England and to London, where he pursued the same methods, though his father importuned him to apply to General Stanhope, as a person he was sure would assist him, having been always a friend to their family, and particularly to old Stanley himself. But Jack was become a favorite with the ladies, and had taken an easier road to what he accounted happiness, living either upon the benevolence of friends, the fortune of the dice, or the favors of the sex. A continual round of sensual delights employed his time, and he was so far from endeavoring to attain any other commission or employment in order to support him, that there was nothing he so much feared as his being obliged to quit that life he loved, for old Stanley was continually soliciting for him, and as he had very good interest, nothing but his son's notorious misbehavior made him not prevail. In the current of his extravagancies, Jack fixed himself often upon young men coming into the world, and under pretense of being their tutor in the fashionable vices of the town, shared in their pleasures and helped them squander their estates. Of this stamp was a gay young Yorkshire squire, who, by the death of an uncle, and by the loss of his father while a boy, had had so little education as not to know how to use it. Him Stanley got hold of, and persuaded him that nothing was so advantageous to a young gentleman as travel, and drew him to make a tour of Flanders and Holland in his company. Though a very wild young fellow, Stanley gave a very tolerable account of the places, especially the fortifications which he had seen, and sufficiently demonstrated how capable he might have been of making an exalted figure in the world if due care had been taken to furnish him with any principles in his youth. But the neglect of that undid him, and every opportunity which he afterwards had of acquiring anything, instead of making him an accomplished gentleman, did him mischief. Thus, his journey to Paris, in company with the aforementioned gentleman, helped him to an opportunity of learning to fence to the greatest perfection, so that the skill he was sensible he had in the sword made him ever ready to quarrel and seek occasions to use it. Amongst the multitude of his amours, he became acquainted and passionately fond of one Mrs. Maycock, whose husband was once an eminent tradesman upon Ludgate Hill. By her, he had a child, of which also he was very fond. This woman was the source of the far greater part of his misfortunes, for when his father had procured him a handsome commission in the service of the African company, and he had received a considerable sum of money for his voyage, appearing perfectly satisfied himself, and behaving in so grave and decent a manner as filled his family and relations with very agreeable hopes. They were all blasted by Mrs. Maycock's coming with her child to Portsmouth, where he was to embark. She so far prevailed upon his inclinations as to get him to give her one half of the company's money, and to return to town with the other half himself. On his coming up to London, he avoided going to his father's, who no sooner heard how dishonorably his son had behaved, but, laying it more to heart than all the rest of his misfortunes, grief in a short time put an end to them all by his death. When the news of it came to young Stanley, he fell into transports of grief and passion, which, as many of his intimate companions said, so disturbed his brain that he never afterwards was in a right temper. This indeed appeared by several accidents, some of which were sworn at his trial, particularly that while he lodged in the house of Mr. Underhill, somebody having quoted a sentence of Latin in his company, he was so disturbed at the thoughts of his having had such opportunities of acquiring the knowledge of that language, and yet continuing ignorant thereof, 
through his negligence and debauchery, that it made at that time so strong an impression on his spirits that starting up, he drew a penknife and attempted to stab himself without any other cause of passion. At other times, he would fall into sudden and grievous rages, either at trifles or at nothing at all, abuse his best friends, and endeavor to injure himself, and then, coming to a better temper, begged them to forgive him, for he did not know what he did. During the latter part of his life, his circumstances were so bad that he was reduced to doing many dirty actions which I am persuaded otherwise would not have happened, such as going into gentlemen's select companies at taverns, without any other ceremony than telling them that his impudence must make him welcome to a dinner with them, after which, instead of thanking them for their kindness, he would often pick a quarrel with them, though strangers, drawing his sword and fighting before he left the room. Such behavior made him obnoxious to all who were not downright debauchees like himself, and hindered persons of rank conversing with him as they were wont. In the meantime, his favorite Mrs. Maycock, whom he had some time lived with as a wife, and even prevailed with his mother to visit her as such, being no longer able to live at his rate or bear with his temper, frequented a house in the old bailey, where it was supposed, and perhaps with truth, that she received other company. This made Stanley very uneasy, who, like most young rakes, thought himself at liberty to pursue as many women as he pleased, but could not forgive any liberties taken by a woman whom he, forsooth, had honored with his affections. One night, therefore, seeing her in Fleet Street with a man and a woman, he came up to her and gently tapped her on the shoulder. She, turning, cried, What? My dear captain! And so on they went, walking to his house in the old bailey. There some words happened about the mutual misfortunes they had brought upon one another. Mrs. Maycock reproached him with seducing her and bringing on all the miseries she had ever felt. Stanley reflected on her hindering his voyage to Cape Coast, the extravagant sums he had spent upon her, and her now conversing with other men, though she had had three or four children by him. At last they grew very high, and Mrs. Maycock, who was naturally a very sweet-tempered woman, was so far provoked, as Stanley said, that she threw a cup of beer at him, upon which some ill names passing between them, Stanley drew his sword and stabbed her between the breasts eight inches deep, immediately upon which he stopped his handkerchief into the wound. He was quickly secured and committed to Wood Street Compter, where he expressed very little concern at what had happened, laughing and giving himself abundance of airs, such as by no means became a man in his condition. On his commitment to Newgate, he seemed not to abate the least of that vivacity which was natural to his temper, and, as he had too much mistaken vice for the characteristic of a fine gentleman, so nothing appeared to him so great a testimony of gallantry and courage as behaving intrepidly while death was so near its approach. He therefore entertained all who conversed with him in the prison, and all who visited him from without, with the history of his amours and the favors that had been bestowed on him by a multitude of fine ladies. Nay, his vanity and impudence was so great as to mention some of their names, and especially to asperse two ladies who lived near Cheapside Conduit. But there is great reason to believe that part of this was put on to make his madness more probable at his trial, where he behaved very oddly, and, when he received sentence of death, took snuff at the bar and put on abundance of airs that were even ridiculous anywhere, and shocking and scandalous upon so melancholy an occasion. After sentence, his carriage under his confinement altered not so much as one would have expected. He, 
offering to lay wagers that he should never be hanged, notwithstanding his sentence, for he was resolved not to die like a dog on a string, when he had it in his power always to go out of the world a nobler way, by which he meant either a knife or opium, which were the two methods by one of which he resolved to prevent his fate. But when he found that all his pretenses of madness were like to produce nothing, and that he was in danger of dying in every respect like a brute, he laid aside much of his ill-timed gaiety, and began to think of preparing for death after another manner. These gentlemen who assisted him while in Newgate were so kind as to offer to make up a considerable sum of money, if it could have been of any use, but, finding that neither that nor their interest could do anything to save him, they frankly acquainted him therewith, and begged him not to delude himself with false hopes. All the while he was in Newgate, a little boy, whom he had by Mrs. Maycock, continued with him, and lay constantly in his bosom. He manifested the utmost tenderness and concern for that poor child, who, by his rashness, had been deprived of his mother, and whom the law would, by its just sentence, now likewise deprive of its father. Being told that Mr. Bryan, Mrs. Maycock's brother on Tower Hill, was dead, merely through concern at his sister's misfortunes and the deplorable end that followed them, Stanley clapped his hands together and cried, What? More death still? Sure I am the most unfortunate wretch that was ever born. Some few days before his execution, talking to one of his friends, he said, I am perfectly convinced that it is false courage to avoid the just sentence of the law by executing the rash dictates of one's rage by one's own head. I am heartily sorry for the rash expression I have been guilty of, of that sort, and am determined to let the world see my courage fails me no more in my death than it has done in my life. And, my dear friend, added he, I never felt so much ease, quiet, and satisfaction in all my life as I have experienced since my coming to this resolution. But though he sometimes expressed himself in a serious and religious manner, yet passion would sometimes break in upon him to the last, and make him burst out into frightful and horrid speeches. Then again he would grow calm and cool, and speak with great seeming sense of God's providence in his afflictions. He was particularly affected with two accidents which happened to him not long before his death, and which struck him with great concern at the time they happened. The first of these was a fall from his horse under Tyburn, in which he was stunned so that he could not recover strength enough to remount, but was helped on his horse again by the assistance of two friends. Not long after which, he had as bad an accident of the same kind under Newgate, which he said made such an impression on him that he did not go abroad for many mornings afterwards without recommending himself in the most serious manner to the divine protection. Another story he also told, with many marks of real thankfulness for the narrow escape he then made from death, which happened thus. At a cider cellar in Covent Garden, he fell out with one Captain Chickley, and challenging him to fight in a dark room, they were then shut up together for some space. But a constable being sent for by the people of the house, and breaking the door open, delivered him from being sent altogether unprepared out of the world, Chickley being much too hard for him, and having given him a wound quite through the body, himself escaping with only a slight cut or two. As the day of execution drew near, Mr. Stanley appeared more serious and much more attentive to his devotions than hitherto he had been. Yet could he not wholly contain himself even then, for the Sunday before he died, after sermon, at which he had behaved himself decently and modestly, he broke out into this wild expression, that he was only sorry he had not fired the whole house where he killed Mrs. Maycock, when he was reproved for these things, 
he would look ashamed and say, "'Twas true, they were very unbecoming, but they were what he could not help, arising from certain starts in his imagination that hurried him into a short madness, for which he was very sorry as soon as he came to himself. At the place of execution, to which he was conveyed in a mourning coach, he turned pale, seemed uneasy, and complained that he was very sick, entreating a gentleman by him to support him with his hand. He desired to be unbound, that he might be at liberty to pray kneeling, which with some difficulty was granted. He then applied himself to his devotions with much fervency, and then submitted to his fate. But when the cap was drawn over his eyes, he seemed to shed tears abundantly. Immediately before he was turned off, he said his friends had provided a hearse to carry away his body, and he hoped nobody would be so cruel as to deny his relations his dead limbs to be interred, adding that unless he were assured of this, he could not die in peace. Such was the end of a young man in person and capacity, every way fitted to have made a reputable figure in the world, if either his natural principles or his education had laid any restraint upon his vices. But, as his passions hurried him beyond all bounds, so they brought a just end upon themselves by finishing a life spent in sensual pleasures with an ignominious death, which happened at Tyburn in the twenty-fifth year of his age, on the twenty-third of December, 1722. End of section 47 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 48 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward, Section 48, The Life of Stephen Gardiner, a Highwayman and Housebreaker. Stephen Gardiner was the son of parents of middling circumstances, living at the time of his birth in Moorfields. This, perhaps, was the immediate cause of his ruin, since he learnt there, while a boy, to idle away his time, and to look on nothing as so great a pleasure as gaming and cudgel-playing. This took up equally his time and his thoughts, till he grew up to about fourteen years old, when his friends placed him out as an apprentice to a weaver. While he was with his master, he did so many unlucky tricks as occasioned not only severe usage at home, but incurred also the dislike and hatred of all the neighbors, so that, instead of interposing to preserve him from his master's correction, they were continually complaining and getting him beaten. Nay, sometimes, when his master was not ready enough to do it, would beat him themselves. Stephen was so wearied out with this kind of treatment, notwithstanding it arose solely from his own fault, that he determined to run away for good and all, thinking it would be no difficult matter for him to maintain himself, considering that dexterity with which he played at nine pins, skittles, etc. But experience quickly convinced him of the contrary, so in one month being much reduced after betaking himself to this life, by those misfortunes which were evident enough, though his passion for liberty and idleness hindered him from foreseeing them, that he had not so much as bread to eat. In this distressed condition, he was glad to return home again to his friends, imploring their charity, and that, forgetting what was past, they would be so kind as to relieve him and put him in some method of providing for himself. Natural affection pleading for him, notwithstanding all his failings, 
they took him home again, and soon after put him as a boy on board a corn vessel, which traded to Holland and France. But the swearing, quarreling, and fighting of the sailors so frightened him, being then very young and unable to cope with them, that on his return he again implored the tenderness of his relations to permit his staying in England upon any terms, promising to live in a most sober and regular manner, provided that he might get his bread by hard labor at home and not be exposed to the injuries of wind and weather and the abuses of seamen more boisterous than both. They again complied and put him to another trade, but work, it seems, was a thing no shape could reconcile to him, and so he ran away from thence, too, and once more put himself for a livelihood upon the contrivance of his own brain. He went immediately to his old employment and old haunt, Moorfields, where, as long as he had any money, he played at cards, skittles, etc., with the chiefs of those villainous gangs that haunt the place, and when reduced to the want both of money and clothes, he attempted to pick pockets, or by playing with the lads for farthings to recruit himself. But pocket-picking was a trade in which he had very ill luck, for taking a wig out of a gentleman's pocket at the drawing of the state lottery, the man suffered him totally to take it out, then seized him and cried out, Pickpocket! The boy immediately dropped it, and, giving it a little kick with his foot, protected his innocence, which induced a good-natured person there present to stand so far his friend that he suffered no deeper that bout. But a month after, being taken in the same manner and delivered over to the mob, they handled him with such cruelty as scarce to leave him life, though he often upon his knees begged them to carry him before a justice and let him be committed to Newgate. But the mob were not so to be prevailed on, and this severity, as he said, cured him effectually of that method of thieving. But in the course of his rambling life, becoming acquainted with two young fellows whose names were Garraway and Sly, they invited him to go with them upon some of their expeditions in the night. He absolutely refused to do anything of that kind for a long time, but one evening, having been so unlucky as to lose not only his money, but all his clothes off his back, he went in search of Sly and Garraway, who received him with open arms, and immediately carried him with them upon those exploits by which they got their living. Garraway proposed robbing of his brother for their first attempt, which succeeded so far as their getting into the house, but they found nothing there but a few clothes of his brother and sister, which they took away. But Garraway bid them not be discouraged at the smallness of the booty, for his father's house was as well furnished as most men's, and their next attack should be upon that. To this they agreed, and plundered it also, taking away some spoons, tankards, salts, and several other pieces of plate of considerable value. But a quick search being made, they were all three apprehended, and Gardiner, being the youngest, was admitted in evidence against the other two who were convicted. Some weeks after, Gardiner got his liberty, but being unwarned, he went on still at the same rate. The first robbery he committed afterwards was in the house of the father of one of his acquaintances on Addle Hill, where Gardiner stole softly upstairs into the garret and stole from thence some men's apparel to a very considerable value. A while after this, he became acquainted with Mr. Richard Jones, and with him went, mounted upon a strong horse, into Wales, upon what in the canting dialect is called the passing lay, which in plain English is thus. They get countrymen into an alehouse under pretense of talking about the sale of cattle. Then a pack of cards is found as if by accident, and the two sharpers fall to playing with one another, 
until one offering to lay a great wager on the game staking the money down the other shows his hand to the countryman and convinces him that it is impossible but he must win offering to let him go halves in the wager as soon as the countryman lays down the money these sharpers manage so as to pass off with it which is the meaning of their cant and this practice he was very successful in the country people in wales where they travelled having not had opportunity to become acquainted with such bites as those who live in the counties nearer london have where the country fellows are often as adroit as any of the sharpers themselves it happened that the person with whom stephen travelled had parted with his wife and at bristol had received a gold watch and chain laced clothes and several other things of value this immediately put it into gardiner's head that he might make his fortune at once by murdering him and possessing himself of his goods knowing also that besides these valuable things he had near a hundred guineas about him in order to effect this he stole a large brass pestle out of a mortar at the next inn and carried it unperceived in his boots intending as he and his companion rode through the woods to dash his brains out with it twice for this purpose he drew it but his heart relenting just when he was going to give the stroke he put it up again at last it fell out of his boot and he had much ado to get it pulled up unperceived by his companion the next day it dropped again and gardner was so much afraid of jones perceiving it and himself being thereupon killed from a suspicion of his design that he laid aside all further thoughts of that matter but he took occasion a day or two after to part with him whereupon the other as stephen was going away called out to him hark ye you gardener i'll tell you somewhat gardener therefore turning back you are going up to london said jones yes replied gardener then trust me said the other you're going up to be hanged between abergavenny and monmouth gardener took notice of a little house the windows of which were shut up but the hens and cocks in the back yard showed that it was inhabited gardener thereupon knocked at the door several times to see if anybody was at home but perceiving none he ventured to break open some wooden bars that lay across the window and getting in thereat found two boxes full of clothes and writings relating to an estate he took only one gown as not daring to load himself with clothes for fear of being discovered on the road being then coming up to london a very short space after his return he committed that fact for which he died which was by breaking open the house of dorcas roberts widow and stealing thence a great quantity of linen and he was soon after apprehended in bed with one of the fine shirts upon his back and the rest of the linen stowed under the bed when carried before the justice he said that one martin brought the linen to him and gave him two fine shirts to conceal it in his brandy shop but this pretense being thought impossible both by the magistrate who committed him and by the jury who tried him he was convicted for that offence and being an old offender he had no hopes of mercy he applied himself therefore with all the earnestness he was able to prepare himself sufficiently for that change he was about to make he said that an accident which happened about a year before gave him great apprehension and for some time prevented his continuing in that wicked course of life the accident he mentioned was this being taken up for some trivial thing or other and carried to st sepulchre's watch-house the constable was so kind as to dismiss him but the bellman of the parish happening to come in before he went out the constable said young man be careful 
I am much afraid this bellman will say his verses over you. At which Gardiner was so much struck, he could scarce speak. Stephen had a very great notion of mortifying his body as some atonement for the crimes he had committed. He therefore fasted some time while under sentence, and though the weather was very cold, yet he went to execution with no other covering on him but his shroud. At Tyburn he addressed himself to the people, and begged they would not reflect upon his parents, who knew nothing of his crimes. Seeing several of his old companions in the crowd, he called out to them, and desired them to take notice of his death, and by amending their lives, avoid following him thither. He died the 3rd of February, 1723-4. to four. End of section 48. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 49 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward, Section 49, The Lives of Samuel Ogden, John Pugh, William Frost, Richard Woodman, and William Alicia, Highwaymen, Footpads, Housebreakers, etc. Samuel Ogden was the son of a sailor in Southwark, who bred him to his own employment, in which he wrought honestly for many years, until he fell very ill of dropsy, for the cure of which, being carried to St. Thomas's Hospital, he, after his recovery, applied himself to selling fish, instead of going again to sea. How he came to be engaged in the crimes he afterwards perpetrated we cannot well learn, and therefore shall not pretend to relate. However, he associated himself with a very numerous gang such as Mills, Pew, Blunt, Bishop, Gutteridge, and Matthews, who became the evidence against him. He positively averred that one of the robberies for which he was convicted was the first he ever committed. He expressed the greatest horror and detestation for murder imaginable, protesting he was no ways guilty of that committed on Brixton Causeway. At the time of his trial at Kingston, he behaved himself very insolently and audaciously, but when sentence had been passed upon him, most of that unruly temper was lost, and he began to think seriously of preparing for another world. He confessed that his sins were many, and that judgment against him was just, meekly accepting his death as the due rewards of his deeds. He was the example of seriousness and penitence to the other twelve malefactors who suffered with him, being about thirty-seven years of age at the time of his decease. John Pugh, otherwise Blueskin, was born at Morpeth, near Newcastle upon Tyne. His father was a carrier in tolerable business and circumstance, who put him to be a servant in a silver spinner's in Moorfields, where he soon learnt all sorts of wickedness, beginning with defrauding his master, and doing any other little tricks of that kind as opportunity would give him leave. We are told of him, what perhaps can be hardly said of any other criminal who hath died in the same way for many years past, that though he was but twenty-two years of age, he had spent twelve of them in cheating, pilfering, and robbing. At last he fell into the gang that brought him to his death, for a robbery committed by several of them in the county of Surrey. Pew, though so young a fellow, was so unaccountably stupid and wicked, that though he made a large and particular confession of his guilt, yet it was done in such a manner as plainly showed his crimes made no just impression upon his heart. All he said, being in the language of the Kingston ordinary, 
the sleepy apprehensions of unawakened ignorance in which condition he continued to the last william frost a cripple was the son of a pin maker in christ church parish southwark and as to his education my account says it was in hereditary ignorance he had wrought it seems while a boy at his father's trade of pin making but since he was thirteen or fourteen had addicted himself to that preparative trade to the gallows shoe blacking while he continued in this most honorable profession abundance of opportunities offered for robbing in the night season and we must do him the justice to say that they were not offered in vain thus by degrees he came on to robbing on the road and in the streets until he was apprehended and upon the evidence of his companion was convicted the sunday after this he with the rest of the malefactors was brought to the parish church which was the first time as he declared he had ever entered one at least with an intention to hear and observe what was said there he made a blundering sort of confession and would perhaps have been more penitent if he had known well what penitence was but he was a poor stupid doltish wretch scarce sensible even of the misfortune of being hanged he was however very attentive in the cart to the prayer of those who were a little better instructed than himself and finished a wretched life with an ignominious death at twenty-one years of age richard woodman was born at newington in surrey he got his bread some years by selling milk about but thinking labor too great a price for victuals he addicted himself to getting an easier livelihood by thieving in this course he soon got in with a gang who let him want no instructions that were necessary to bring him to the gallows amongst them the above-mentioned lame man was his principal tutor the last robbery but one that they ever committed was upon a poor man who had laid out his money in the purchase of a shoulder of mutton to feast his family but they disappointed him by taking it away and with it a bundle of clothes and other necessaries by which the unfortunate person who lost them though their value was not much in themselves lost all he had his behavior was pretty much of a piece with the rest of his companions that is he was so unaffected either with the shamefulness of his death or the danger of his soul that perhaps never any creatures went to death in a more odd manner than these did whose behavior cannot for all that be charged with any rudeness or want of decency but religion and repentance were things so wholly new to them and so unsuited to their comprehension that there needed a much greater length of time than they had to have given them any true sense of their duty to which it cannot be said they were so averse as they were ignorant and incapable william alicia was another of these wretches but he seemed to have had a better education than most of them though he made as ill use of it as any he was once an evidence at croydon assizes where he convicted two of his companions but the sight of their execution and the consciousness of having preserved his own life merely by taking theirs did not in the least contribute to his amendment for he was no sooner at liberty but he was engaged in new crimes until at last with those malefactors before mentioned and with eight others he was executed at kingston in the twenty-fourth year of his age april fourth seventeen twenty four End of section forty nine. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section fifty of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses. Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bo Wood Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1 
Edited by Arthur L. Hayward Section 50 The Life of Thomas Burden A Robber Thomas Burden was born in Dorsetshire of parents in tolerable circumstances, who being persons getting their living by seamen, they bred up their son to that profession and sent him very young to sea. It does not appear that he ever liked that employment, but rather that he was hurried into it when he was very young by the choice of his parents, and therefore in no condition to choose better for himself. He was up in the straits several years, and while there in an abundance of fights, at which time he had so much religion as to apply himself diligently to God in prayer for his protection, and made abundance of vows and resolutions of amendment, if it pleased the providence of God to preserve his life. But no sooner was the danger over, but all these promises were forgotten, until the next time he was in jeopardy. At this rate he went on until the war was over, and notwithstanding the aversion he always had to a military kind of life, yet such was his unconquerable aversion to labor that he rather enlisted himself in the land service than submit thereto. Going, however, one day to Hounslow, to the house of one of the staff officers of his regiment, and not finding him at home, but only a corporal, who had been left at the house to give answers. With this corporal he sat chatting and talking until night, so that being obliged to stay there until the next morning, a discourse, somehow or other, happened between him and the person who entertained him about William Zotch, an old man who lived alone on the common. And Burden, having been drinking, it came into his head how easily he might rob such an old man, upon which he immediately went to his house, and finding him sitting on the bench at his door, he began to talk with and ask him questions. The old man answered him with great mildness, until at last Burden drew an iron instrument out of his cane threatening him with death if he did not reveal where his money was. Zotch thereupon brought it him in a pint pot, being but one in thirty shillings. Then, tying the old man in his chair, Burden left him. But it seems he did not tie him so fast, but that he easily got loose, and alarming the town, Burden was quickly taken having fled along the common which was open to the eye for a long way, instead of taking into the town or the woods, which if he had, in all probability, he might have escaped. When Whittington and Greenbury apprehended him, he did not deny the fact, but on the contrary offered them money to let him go. After his conviction, he manifested vast uneasiness at the thoughts of death, appearing wonderfully moved that he, who had lived so long in the world with the reputation of an honest man, should now die with that of a thief and in the manner of a dog. But his death grew nearer, and he saw there was no remedy. He began to be a little more penitent and resigned, especially when he was comforting himself with the hopes that his temporal punishment here might preserve him from feeling everlasting misery. With these thoughts, having somewhat composed himself, he approached the place where he was to suffer with tolerable temper and constancy, entreating the people who were there in very great numbers to pray for him, and begging that all, by his example, would learn to stifle the first motions 
of wickedness and sin, since such was the depravity of human nature that no man knew how soon he might fall. At the same place, he delivered a paper in which he much extenuated the crime for which he suffered, and from whence he would fain have insinuated that it was a rash action committed when in drink, and which he should certainly have set right again when he was sober. In this frame of mind, he suffered on the 29th of April, 1724, being then about 50 years of age. End of section 50. Recording by Bo Wood. Section 51 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Miles Live of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward Section 51, The Life of Frederick Schmidt, Alterer of Banknotes The Life of Frederick Schmidt, Alterer of Banknotes when persons sin out of ignorance, there is great room for pity, and when persons suddenly become guilty of evil through a precipitate yielding to the violence of their passions, there is still room for extenuation. But when people sin, not only against knowledge, but deliberately, and without the incitement of any violent passion such as anger or lust, even as nothing can be said in alleviation, so there is little or no room left for compassion. Frederick Schmidt was a person born of a very honorable and wealthy family at Breslau, the capital of the Duchy of Silesia in the northeast of Germany. They educated this their son not only in such a manner as might qualify him for the occupation they designed him of a merchant, but also gave him a most learned and liberal knowledge, such as suited a person of the highest rank. He lived, however, at Breslau as a merchant for many years, and at the request of his friends, when very young, he married a lady of considerable fortune, but upon some disgust at her behavior they parted, and had not lived together for many years before his death. He carried on a very considerable correspondence to Hamburg, Amsterdam, and other places, and above a year before had been over in England to transact some affairs, and thought it, it seemed, so easy a matter to live here by his wits, that he returned hither with the Baron Van Loden and the Countess Van Loden. It is very hard to say what these people really were, some people taking Schmidt for the baron's servant, but he himself affirmed, and indeed it seems most likely, that they were companions, and that both of them exerted their utmost skill in defrauding others to maintain her. The method they took here for that purpose was by altering banknotes, which they did so dexterously as absolutely to prevent all suspicion. They succeeded in paying away two of them, but the fraud being discovered by the checkbook at the bank, Schmidt was apprehended and brought to a trial. There it was sworn that being in possession of a banknote of twenty-five pounds, he had turned it into one of eighty-five pounds, and with the Baron Van Loden tendered it to one Monsieur Mallory, who gave him goods for it and another note of twenty pounds. It was deposed by the Baron Van Loden and Eleonora Sophia, Countess Van Loden, that Schmidt took the last mentioned note of twenty pounds upstairs and soon after brought it down again, the word twenty being taken out, upon which they drew it through a plate of gummed water, and then smoothing it between several papers with a box iron, the words one hundred were written in its place. Then he gave it to the baron and the interpreter to go out with it and buy plate, which they did to the amount of forty pounds. 
It appeared also by the same witnesses that Schmidt had owned to the Baron that he could write twenty hands, and that if he had but three or four hundred pounds, he could swell them to fifty thousand. It was proved also by his own confession that he had written over to his correspondent in Holland to know whether English banknotes went currently there or not upon which he was found guilty by a party jury, that singular favor permitted to foreigners by the equitable leniency of the law of England. Yet, after this, he could hardly be persuaded that his life was in any danger. Nay, when he came into the condemned hold, he told the unhappy persons there, in as good English as he could speak, that he should not be hanged with them. For the first two or three days, therefore, that he was under sentence, he refused to look so much as on a book or to say a prayer, employing that time with unwearied diligence in writing a multitude of letters to merchants, foreign ministers, and German men of quality and such like, still holding fast his old opinion that his life was not in the least danger. And when a Lutheran minister was so kind as to visit him, he would hardly condescend to speak with him. But when he had received a letter from him who had all along buoyed him up with hopes of safety, in which he informed him that all those hopes were vain, he then began to apply himself with a real concern to the Lutheran minister, whom he had before almost rejected, but did not appear terrified or much affrighted thereat. However, quickly after, he fell into a fit of sickness, and became so very weak as not to be able to stand. He confessed, however, to the foreign divine who attended him that he was really guilty of that crime for which he was to die, though it did not appear that he conceived it to be capital at the time he did it, nor, indeed, was he easily convinced it was so until within a few days of his execution. There had prevailed a report about the town that he had done something of the like nature at Paris, for which he had been obliged to fly, but he absolutely denied that and seemed to think the story derived its birth from the baron, who, he said, was an apothecary's son, and from his acquaintance with his father's trade, knew the secret of expunging waters. He added that his heirs of innocence were very unjust, he having been guilty of abundance of such tricks, and the countess of many more than he. Thus, as is very common in such cases, these unhappy people blackened one another. But the baron and the countess had the advantage, since by their testimony poor Schmidt was dispatched out of the way, and tis probable their credit at the time of his execution was not in any great danger of being hurt by his character of them. When he came to Tyburn, being attended in the cart by the Lutheran minister whom I have so often mentioned, he was forced to be held up, being so weak as not to be able to stand alone. He joined with the prayers at first, but could not carry on his attention to the end, looking about him and staring at the other prisoners with a curiosity that perhaps was never observed in any other prisoner in his condition whatsoever. Neither his looks nor his behavior seemed to express so much terror as was struck into others by the sight of his condition. So after recommending to the minister by letter to inform his aged mother in Germany of his unhappy fate, he requested the executioner to put him to death as easily as he could. He then submitted to his fate on the 4th of April, 1724, being in the 45th year of his age. End of section 51「Section 52 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jervis A. Hudson of JervisSpeaks.wordpress.com Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1 Edited by Arthur L. Hayward, Section 52 The Life of Peter Curtis A Housebreaker, Etc. 
Peter Curtis, alias Friend, was born of honest but industrious parents in the country at a very great distance from London, finding a method to get him put apprentice to a ship's carpenter they were very much pleased therewith, hoping that they had settled him in a trade in which he might live well, and much beyond anything they could have expected to have done for him. But Peter himself was of a very different opinion, for from the hour he came to it, he greatly disliked his profession, and though he went to sea with his master once or twice, yet he failed not to take hold of the first opportunity to set himself at liberty by running away from him. From that time, he devoted himself to live a life of pleasure, having contracted an obstinate aversion to business and to everything which looked like labor. Though, as be acknowledged, the hand of providence hindered him from accomplishing his wish, making this life that he chose a greater burden and hardship to him than that which he had relinquished. He found means to get into gentlemen's service and lived in them with tolerable reputation and credit for the space of several years. At last he was resolved to go to sea again, but he had so unconquerable an aversion to his own trade that he chose rather going in the capacity of a trumpeter, having learnt how to play on the instrument at one of his services. He sailed on the Salisbury. In that expedition, Sir George Bing made to the Straits of Messina when he attacked and destroyed the Spanish fleet. There, Peter had the good luck to escape without any hurt, though there were many killed and wounded on board that ship. He afterwards served in a regiment of dragoons, where by prudent management he saved no less than four score pounds. With this, he certainly had it in his power to put himself in some way of doing well, but he omitted it, and falling into the company of a lewd woman, she persuaded him to take a lodging with her, and they lived together for some space as man and wife. During this time, he made a shift to be bound for one of his companions, for a very considerable sum, which the other had the honesty to leave him to pay. The creditor, upon information that Curtis was packing up his alls, an old-fashioned play on words, all and all, and means, of course, packing up all his possessions to go to sea again, resolved to secure him for his debt. But not being able to catch him upon a writ, he made up a felonious charge against him, and having thereupon got him committed to the paltry computer, as soon as the justice has discharged him, he got him taken for the debt and recommitted to the same place. Here he was soon reduced to a very melancholy condition, having neither necessities of life, not any prospect of a release. The wretched company with which such prisons are always full corrupted him as to his honesty and taught him first to think of making himself rich by taking away the properties of others. When he came out of prison upon an agreement with his creditor, he soon got into service with Mr. Fluellen Aspley, a very eminent Chinaman by stocks market, a busy market for fish and vegetables which accompanied the site on which the present mansion house stands. The market was moved in 17... 37 to Fair Ringdon Street. When he was there, the bad woman with whom he still conversed was continually dunning his air with how easy a matter it was for him to make himself and her rich and easy by pliffering from his master, telling him that she and her friends in the country would help him off with a thousand pounds worth of china if need were, and baiting him continually not to lose such an opportunity of enriching them. The fellow himself was adverse to such practices, and nothing but her continual teasing could have induced him ever to have entertained a design of so base a matter. At last he condescended so far as to inquire how it might be done with safety. For that, replied the woman, trust to my management. I'll put you in a way to bring off the most 
valuable things in the house and yet get a good character and be trusted and valued by the family for having robbed them. At that, Curtis stared and said if she'd but put him to such a road he did not know but might comply with her request. She therefore opened her scheme to him this, Here's my son. You shall lift him into the house, and after you have given him plate and what you think proper, and my boy, who is a very dexterous lad, is got off with them, you have nothing to do but to put an end of a candle under the Indian cabinet in the counting house and leave things to themselves. The neighborhood will soon be alarmed by the fire, and if you are apparently honest in what you take away publicly, there will be no suspicion upon you for what went before, which will be either thought to be destroyed in the fire or to be taken away by some other means. This appeared so shocking a project to Curtis that he absolutely refused to comply with the burning, though with much ado he was brought to stealing a large quantity of plate, which he brought to this woman, but in attempting to sell it she was stopped, and the robbery discovered. However, there being no direct evidence at first against Curtis, he was released from his confinement on suspicion even by the intercession of Mr. Aspley himself. But a little time discovering the mistake and that he was really the principal in the robbery, he was thereupon again apprehended at the next sessions, tried and convicted. While he lay under sentence of death, he behaved himself as if he had totally resigned all thoughts of the world or of continuing in it, praying with great fervency and devotion making full and large confession, and doing every other act which might induce men to believe that he was a very penitent and sincerely sorry and affected for the crime he had committed. But it seems that this was all put on, for the true source of his easiness and resignation was the assurance he had in himself of escaping death, either by pardon or by an escape, for which purpose he and those who were under sentence with him had provided all necessaries, loosened their irons, and intended to have effected it at the expense of the lives of their keepers. But their design being discovered the Saturday before their deaths, and Curtis perceiving that his hopes of pardon were ill-founded, began to imply himself to repenting in earnest. Yet there was very little time left for so great a work, especially considering that nothing but the necessity of the thing inclined him thereto, and that he had spent the respite allowed him by the clemency of the law to prepare for death in contriving to fly from justice at the expense of the blood of others. How he performed this it is impossible for us to know and must be left to be decided by the great judge, to whom the secrets of all hearts are open. However, at his death he appeared tolerably composed and cheerful, and turned to the people, said, You see, they who contrived to burn the house and the people in it escaped, but I, who never consented to any such thing, die as you see. Some discourse there was of his having buried a portmanteau, and about fourteen hundred pounds. He was spoke to about it, and did not deny he had it. He said he had hid it upon Finchley Common, and that by the arms, which was the spread eagle, he thought to be an ambassador's. As to the diamond ring he had been seen to wear, he did not affirm he came very honestly by it, but would not give any direct answer concerning it, and seemed uneasy that he should have such questions put to him at the very point of death. He suffered the 15th of June, 1724, about 30 years of age. End of section 52. Recording by Jervis A. Hudson of jervisspeaks.wordpress.com.
Section 53 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Miles lives of the most remarkable criminals who have been condemned and executed volume one edited by arthur l hayward section fifty three the life of lumley davis a highwayman the life of lumley davis a highwayman such is the frailty of human nature that neither the best examples nor the most liberal education can warrant an honest life or secure to the most careful parents the certainty of their children not becoming a disgrace to them either in their lives or by their deaths this malefactor of whom the course of our memoirs now obliges us to make mention was the son of a man of the same name viz lumley davis who was it seems in circumstances good enough to procure his sons being brought up in one of the greatest and best schools in england there his proficiency procured him an election upon the establishment and he became respected as a person whose parts would do honor even to that remarkable seminary of learning where he had been bred but unaccountably growing fond all on a sudden of going to some trade or employment and absolutely refusing to continue any longer at his studies his friends were obliged to comply with the ardency of his request and accordingly put him apprentice to an eminent vintner at the one ton tavern in the strand he continued there but a little while before he was as much dissatisfied with that as he had been with learning so that leaving his master and leading an unsettled kind of life he fell into great debts being unable to satisfy which when demanded he was arrested and thrown into the marshalsea there for some time he continued in a very deplorable condition till by the charitable assistance of a friend his debt was paid and the fees of the prison discharged after this he went into the mint footnote the southwark mint was a sanctuary for insolvent debtors and a nest of infamy in general it stood over against st george's church and a footnote where drinking accidentally at one of the tap houses in that infamous place and being very much out of humor with a low and profligate company he was obliged to converse with there he took notice of a very genteel man who sat at a table by himself he inquired of some persons with whom he was drinking who that man was they answered that they could not tell themselves he was lately come over for shelter amongst them he was a gentleman as folks said of much learning and though he never conversed with anybody yet was kind enough to afford them his assistance either with his pen or by his advice when they asked it on this character davis was very industrious to become his acquaintance and harmon which was the other man's name not having been able to meet with anybody there with whom he could converse he very readily embraced the society of davis with whom comparing notes and finding their case to be pretty much the same they often condoled one another's misfortunes and as often projected between themselves how to gain some supply without depending continually upon the charity of their friends in the meantime davis was so unfortunate as to fall ill of a languishing distemper which brought him so low as to oblige him to apply for relief to that friend who had discharged him out of the marshalsea he was so good as to get him into st thomas's hospital and to supply him while there with whatever was necessary for his support when he was so far recovered as to be able to go abroad this kind and good friend provided for him a country habitation where he might be able to live in privacy and comfort and indulge himself in those inclinations which he began again to show towards learning 
Some time after he had been there, not being able to support longer that quiet kind of life, which before he did so earnestly desire, notwithstanding the entreaties of his friends, he came up to London again, where, falling into idle company, he became addicted to the vices of drinking and following bad women, things which before he had both detested and avoided. Not long after this, he again found out Mr. Harmon and renewed his acquaintance with him. He inquired into his past adventures and how he had supported himself since they last had been together, and on perceiving that they were far from being on the mending hand with him, the fatal proposal was at last made of going upon the road, and there robbing such persons as might seem best able to spare it, and at the same time furnish them with the largest booty. The first person they attacked was one John Nichols Esquire, from whom they took a guinea and seventeen shillings, which with they determined to make themselves easy a little, and not go that week again upon any such hazardous exploits. But, alas, their resolutions had little success, for that very evening they were both apprehended, and on full evidence at the next sessions were convicted and received sentence of death within a very short time after they had committed the crime. Davis, all along, flattered himself with the hopes of a pardon or a reprieve, and therefore was not perhaps so serious as he ought, and as he otherwise would have been. Not that those hopes made him either licentious or turbulent, but rather disturbed his meditations and hindered his getting over the terrors which death always brings to the unprepared. But when, on his name being in the death warrant, he found there was no longer any hopes, he then, indeed, applied himself without losing a moment to the great concern of saving his soul. Now there was no hopes of preserving his body. However, neither his education nor all the assistance he could receive from those divines that visited him could bring him to bear the approach of death with any tolerable patience. Even at the place of execution, he endeavored as much as he could to linger away the time, spoke to the ordinary to spin out the prayers, and to the executioner to forbear doing his office as long as it was possible. However, he spoke with great kindness and affection to his companion, Mr. Harmon, shook hands with those who were his companions in death, and at last submitted to his fate, being then about twenty-three years of age. End of section 53. Section number 54 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward, Section 54. The Life of James Harmon, Highwayman James Harmon was the son of a merchant in the city of London, who took care to furnish his son with such an education as enabled him, when about fourteen years of age, to be removed from the university. His behavior there was like that of too many others, spent in diversities instead of study, and in progression of vice instead of improving in learning. After having been there about three years and having run into such debts as he saw no probability of discharging, he was forced to leave it abruptly, and his father, much grieved at his behavior, bought him an ensign's commission in the army, where he continued in Jones's regiment till it was disbanded. Then, indeed, being forced to live as he could, and the assistance of friends, though large, yet no way suited to his expenses, he became so plunged in debt and other misfortunes that he was in necessity of going over to the mint, where reflecting on his own follies, he became very reserved and melancholy. He would probably have quite, quite altered his course of life if opportunity had offered, or if he had not fallen in that company, which by a similarity of manner induced him to fall into the commission of such crimes, as probably not have otherwise entered his head. The fact which he and the before-mentioned Davids committed was their first and last attempt, but Mr. Harmon, all the time he lay under sentence, without suffering himself to be assumed by expectations of success from those endeavors which he knew his friends used to save his life, accustomed himself to the thoughts of death, 
performing all the duties requisite from a person of his condition for atoning the evils of a misspent life, and making his peace with that being from whom he had received so great a capacity of doing well, and which he had so much abused. Having spent the whole time of his confinement after this manner, he did not appear in any degree shocked or confounded when his name being to the death warrant left him no room to doubt of what must be his fate. At the place of execution he appeared not only perfectly easy and serene, but with an air of satisfaction that could arise only from the peace he enjoyed within. Being asked if he had anything to say to the people, he rose up and turning towards them said, I hope you will all make that use of my being exposed to you as a spectacle which the law intends, and by the sight of my death avoid such acts as may bring you hither, and with the same justice that they do to me. He suffered about the twenty-fifth year of his age, the 28th of August, 1724, at Tyburn. End of section 54Section 55 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1. Edited by Arthur L. Hayward The Life of John Lewis, alias Lawrence, a Thief, Highwayman, etc. One great cause of that degeneracy we observe amongst the lower part of the human species arises from a mistake which has generally prevailed in the education of young people throughout all ages. Parents are sometimes exceedingly assiduous that their children should read well and write a good hand, but they are seldom solicitous about their making a due use of their reason, and hardly ever inquire into the opinions which, while children, they entertain of happiness or misery, and the paths which lead to either of them. This is the true and natural intent of all education whatsoever, which can never tend to anything but teaching persons how to live easily in seducing their affections to the bounds prescribed them by the laws of God and their country. John Lewis, alias Lawrence, had doubtless parents who bred him somewhere, though the papers I have do not afford me light enough to say where. This indeed I find, that he was bred apprentice to a butcher, took up his freedom in the city, and worked for a considerable space as a journeyman. For his honesty we have no vouchers for any part of that time, for in his apprenticeship he fell into the use of profligate company, who taught him all those vices which were destructive to his future life. He grew fond of everything which looked like lewdness and debauchery, drank hard, was continuously idling about. Above all, strumpets the most abandoned, both in their manner and discourse, were the very ultimate end of his wishes, insomuch that he would often say he had nothing to answer for in debauching modest women for they were a set of creatures he could never so much as endure to converse with. His usual method of living with his mistresses was this. As soon as the impudence and lewdness of a woman had made her infamous, even amongst the hackney coachmen, pickpockets, footpads, and such others of his polite acquaintance, then Lewis thought her a fit person for his turn, and used to live with her for a space of perhaps a month, then growing tired of her, he went to look for another. This practice of his grew at last so well known that he found it a little difficult to get women who would take up with him upon his terms. But there was one Maul Davis, who, for her dexterity in picking of pockets amongst those of her own tribe, went by the name of Diver, who was so great a scandal to her sex that the most abandoned of that crew with whom he conversed hated and despised her. With her, Lewis went to live after his usual manner, and was very fond of her after his way, for about a fortnight, at the end of which he grew fractious, and in about nine weeks' time more he beat her. Maul wept, and took on at a sad rate for his unkindness, and told him that if he would but promise faithfully never to live with any other woman, she should fairly present him with a brace of hundred pounds, which she had lodged in the hands of an uncle who knew nothing of her way of life, 
but lived reputably at such a place. This was the right way of touching Lewis's temper. He began to put on as many good looks as his face was capable of wearing, and made use of as many kind expressions as he could remember out of the Academy of Compliments, until the day came that she was to meet her uncle at Smithfield Market. They then went very lovingly together to an inn upon the paven stones, where Maul asked very readily at the bar if Mr. Tompkins, which was the name of her uncle, was there. The woman of the house made her a low curtsy, and said he was only stepped over the way to be shaved, and she would call him. She went accordingly and brought the grave old man, who as soon as he came into the room said, "'Well, Mary, is this thy husband?' "'Yes, sir,' answered she. "'This is the person I have promised to bring you.' Upon which the old man thrust out his hand and said, "'Come, friend, as you have married my niece, you and I must be better acquainted.' Lewis scraped him a good a bow as he could, and giving his hand in return, the old fellow laid hold on him somewhat above the wrist, stamped with his right foot, and then, closing with him, got him down. In the meanwhile, half a dozen fellows broke into the room, and one of them, seizing him by the arms, another pulled out a small twine and bound him. Then, shoving him downstairs, they had no sooner got into Smithfield then the mob cried out, Here's the rogue, here's the dog that held a penknife to the old grazier's throat while a woman and another man robbed him. It seems the story was true of Maul, who by thus taking and then swearing it upon Lewis, who had never so much as heard of it, escaped with impunity, and besides that got five guineas for her pains from the brother of the old man, who upon this occasion played the part of her uncle. If the grazier had been a hasty, rash man, Lewis had certainly hanged for the fact. But looking hard upon him at his trial, he told the court he was sure that Lewis was not the man, for though his eyes were not very good, he could easily distinguish his voice, and added that the man who robbed him was taller than himself, whereas Lewis was much shorter. By which means he had the good luck to come off, though not without lying two sessions in Newgate. As soon as he came abroad, he threatened Maul Davis hard for what she had done, and swore as soon as he could find her to cut her ears off. But she made light of that, and dared him to come and look for her at the brandy shop where she frequented. Lewis, hearing that, resolved to go thither and beat her, and knowing the usual time of her coming thither to be about eleven o'clock at night, he chose that time to come also. But Maul, the day before, had made one of her crew who had turned evidence put him into his information and the constables and their assistants being ready planted they seized him directly and carried him to his old lodgings in newgate he was acquitted upon this next sessions there being no evidence against him but the informer but the court ordered him to find security for his good behavior that proved two months' work, so that in all it was a quarter of a year before he got out of Newgate for the second time. Then, hearing Davis had picked a gentleman's pockets of a considerable sum and kept out of the way upon it, he resolved to be even with her for the trouble she had cost him, and for that purpose hunted through all her old places of resort in order to find out how to have her apprehended. Maul, hearing of it, got her sister, who followed the same trade with herself, to waylay him at the brandy shop in Fleet Street. There, Susan was very sweet upon him, and, being as impudent as her sister, Lewis resolved to take up with her, at least for a night. But she pretended reasons why he could not go home with her, and he complaining that he did not know where to get a lodging, she gave him half a crown and a large silver medal, which she said would pawn for five shillings, and appointed to meet him the next night at the same place. In the morning, Lewis goes with the silver piece to a pawnbroker at Houndstitch. The broker said he would take it into the next room and weigh it, and about ten minutes after returned with a constable and two assistants, the medal having been advertised in the papers as taken with eleven guineas in a green purse out of a gentleman's pocket, and was the very robbery for which Maul Davis kept out of the way. When he got over this, he went down into the country and having been so often in prison for naught, he resolved to merit it now for something. So, on the Gravesend Road, he went upon the highway, and, 
having been, as I told you, bred up a butcher, the weapon he made use of to rob with was his knife. The first robbery he attempted was upon an old officer who was retired into that part of the country to live quiet. Lewis bolted out upon him from behind the corner of a hedge, and clapping a sharp-pointed knife to his breast, with a volley of oaths commanded him to deliver. This was new language to the gentleman to whom it was offered, yet, seeing how great an advantage the villain had of him, he thought it the most prudent method to comply, and gave him, therefore, a few shillings which were in his coat pocket. Lewis very highly resented this, and told him he did not use him like a gentleman, that he would search him himself. In order to do this, clapping his knife into his mouth, as he used to do when preparing a sheep for the shambles, he fell into ransacking the gentleman's pockets. He had hardly got his hand into one of them, but the gentleman snatched the knife out of his mouth, and in the wrench almost broke his jaw. Lewis hereupon took to his heels, but the country being raised upon him, he was apprehended just as he was going to take water at Gravesend. But his pride in refusing the gentleman's silver happened very luckily for him here, for on his trial at the next assizes, the indictment being laid for a robbery, the jury acquitted him, and he was once more put into a road of doing well, which, according to his usual method, he made lead towards the gallows. The first week he was out, he broke open a house in Ratcliffe Highway, from whence he took but a small quantity of things, and those of small value, because there happened to be nothing better in the way. In a few days after this, he snatched off a woman's pocket in the open street, for which fact being immediately apprehended. He was at the next sessions at the Old Bailey, tried and convicted but by the favor of the court, ordered for transportation. A woman, who at this time he called his wife, happened to be under the like sentence at the same time. They went, therefore, together, and were each of them such turbulent dispositions that the captain of the transport thought fit to promise them their liberty in a most solemn manner, as soon as they came on shore in Carolina, provided they would be but quiet. To this they agreed, and they kept their words so well that the captain performed his promise and released them at their arrival in South Carolina, upon which they made no long stay there, but found a method to come back in the same ship. Upon arrival in England, they were actually married, but they did not live long together, Lewis finding that she conversed with other men, and being in fear lest, in hopes of favor, she should discover his return from transportation, and by convicting him save herself. Upon these apprehensions, he thought fit to go again to sea in a ship bound for the straits. But falling violently sick at Genoa, they left him there. And though he might afterwards have gone to his vessel, his old thought and wishes returned, and he took the advantage of the first ship to return to England. Here he found many of his old acquaintances, carrying on the business of plunder in every shape. He joined with them, and in their company broke open with much difficulty an alehouse in Four Street, at the sign of the King of Hearts, where they took a dozen tankards, which they apprehended to be of silver. But finding upon examination they were no better than pewter well scoured, they judged there would be more danger in selling them than they were worth. Therefore, having first melted them, they threw them away. But being a little fearful of robbing in company, he took to his old method of robbing by himself in the streets. But the first attempt he made to do this was in the old artillery ground, where he snatched a woman's pocket, and she, crying out, raised the neighborhood. They pursued him, and after wounding two or three persons desperately, he was taken and committed to his old mansions in Newgate, and being tried at the next sessions, was found guilty, and from that time could not enjoy the least hopes of life but he continued still very obdurate, being so hardened by a continual series of villainous actions that he seemed to have no idea whatsoever of religion, penitence, or atoning by prayers for the numerous villainies he had committed. At the place of execution he said nothing to the people, only that he was sorry he had not stayed in Carolina, because if he had, he should never have come to be hanged and so finished his life in the same stupid manner in which he had lived. 
he was nearly forty years of age at the time he suffered which was on the twenty seventh of june seventeen twenty end of section fifty five recording by scotty smith section fifty six of lives of the most remarkable criminals who have been condemned and executed for murder the highway housebreaking street robberies coining or other offenses volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lives of the most remarkable criminals who have been condemned and executed volume one edited by arthur l hayward the history of the waltham blacks and their transactions to the death of richard parvin edward elliot robert kingshell henry marshall john pink and edward pink and james ansell alias phillips at tyburn whose lives are also included such is the unaccountable folly which reigns in too great a part of the human species that by their own ill deeds they make such laws necessary for the security of men's persons and properties as by their severity unless necessity compelled them would appear cruel and inhuman and doubtless those laws which we esteem barbarous in other nations and even some which appear so though anciently practised in our own had their rise from the same cause i am led to this observation from the folly which certain persons were guilty of in making small insurrections for the sake only of getting a few deer and going on because they found the leniency of the laws could not punish them at present until they grew to that height as to ride in armed troops blacked and disguised in order the more to terrify those whom they assaulted and wherever they were denied what they thought proper to demand whether venison wine money or other necessaries for their debauched feasts would by letter threaten plunder and destroying with fire and sword whomever they thought proper these villainies being carried on with a high hand for some time in the years seventeen twenty two and seventeen twenty three their insolence grew at last so intolerable as to oblige the legislature to make a new law against all who thus went armed and disguised and associated themselves together by the name of blacks or entered into any other confederacies to support and assist one another in doing injuries and violences to the persons and properties of the king's subjects by this law it was enacted that after the first day of june seventeen twenty three whatever persons armed with offensive weapons and having their faces blacked or otherwise disguised should appear in any forest park or grounds enclosed with any wall or fence wherein deer were kept or any warren where hares or conies are kept or in any highway heath or down or unlawfully hunt kill or steal any red or fallow deer or rob any warren or steal fish of any pond or kill or wound cattle or set fire to any house or outhouses stack etc or cut down or any other way destroy trees planted for shelter or profit or shall maliciously shoot at any person or send a letter demanding money or other valuable things shall rescue any person in custody of any officer for any such offences or by gifts or promise procure any one to join with them shall be deemed guilty of felony without benefit of clergy and shall suffer pains of death as felons so convicted nor was even this thought sufficient to remedy those evils which the idle follies of some rash persons had brought about but a retrospect was also by the same act had to offences heretofore committed and all persons who had committed any crimes punishable by this act after the second of february seventeen twenty two were commanded to render themselves before the twenty fourth of july seventeen twenty three to some justice of his majesty's court of king's bench or to some justice of the peace for the county where they lived and there make a full and exact confession of the crimes of such a nature which they had committed 
the times when and the places where and persons with whom together with an account of such persons places of abode as had with them been guilty as aforesaid in order to their being thereupon apprehended and brought to judgment according to law on pain of being deemed felons without benefit of clergy and suffering accordingly but were entitled to a free pardon and forgiveness in case that before the twenty fourth of july they surrendered and made such discovery justices of peace by the said act were required on any information being made before them by one or more credible persons against any person charged with any of the offenses aforesaid to transmit it under their hands and seals to one of his majesty's principal secretaries of state who by the same act is required to lay such information and return before his majesty in council whereupon an order is to issue for the person so charged to surrender within forty days and in case he refuse or neglect to surrender within that time then from the day in which the forty days elapsed he is to be deemed as a felon convict and execution may be awarded as attained of felony by a verdict every person who after the time appointed for the surrender of the person shall conceal aid or succour him knowing the circumstances in which he then stands shall suffer death as a felon without benefit of clergy and that people might the more readily hazard their persons for the apprehending such offenders it is likewise enacted that if any person shall be wounded so as to lose an eye or the use of any limb in endeavouring to take persons charged with the commission of crimes within this law then on a certificate from the justices of the peace of his being so wounded the sheriff of the county if commanded within thirty days after the sight of such certificate to pay the said wounded persons fifty pounds under pain of forfeiting ten pounds on failure thereof and in case any person shall be killed in seizing such persons as aforesaid then the said fifty pounds is to be paid to the executors of the person to be killed it cannot seem strange that in consequence of so extraordinary an act of legislature many of these presumptions and silly people should be apprehended and a considerable number of them having upon their apprehension been committed to winchester jail seven of them by habeas corpus removed for the greater solemnity of their trial to newgate and for their offence brought up and arraigned at the king's bench bar westminster there being convicted on full evidence all of them of felony and three of murder i shall inform ye one by one of what has come to my hand in relation to their crimes and the manner and circumstances with which they were committed richard parvin was master of a public house in portsmouth a man of dull and dogmatic disposition who continually denied his having been in any manner concerned with these people though the evidence against him at his trial was as full and as direct as possibly could have been expected and he himself evidently proved to have been on the spot where the violences committed by the other prisoners were transacted in answer to this he said that he was not with them though indeed he was upon the forest for which he gave this reason he had he said a very handsome young wench who lived with him and for that reason being admired by many of his customers she took it in her head one day to run away he hearing that she had fled across the forest pursued her and in that pursuit calling at the house of mr parford who keeps an alehouse in the forest this man being an evidence against the other blacks took him it seems into the number though as he said he could fully have cleared himself if he had had any money to have sent for some witnesses out of berkshire but the mayor of portsmouth seizing as soon as he was apprehended all his goods put his family into great distress and whether he could have found them or not hindered his being able to produce any witnesses at his trial he persevered in these professions of his innocency to the very last still hoping for a reprieve and not only feeding himself with such expectations while in prison 
but also gazed earnestly when at the tree in hopes that pardon would be brought him until the cart drew away and extinguished life and the desire of life together edward elliot a boy of about seventeen years of age whose father was a tailor at a village between petworth and guildford was the next who received sentence of death with pardon the account he gave of his coming into this society has something very odd in it and which gives a fuller idea of the strange whims which possessed these people the boy said that about a year before his being apprehended thirty or forty men met him in the county of surrey and hurried him away he who appeared to be the chief of them told him that he enlisted him in the service of the king of the blacks in pursuance of which he was to disguise his face obey orders of whatsoever kind they were such as breaking down fish ponds burning woods shooting deer taking also an oath to be true to them or they by their art magic would turn him into a beast and as such make him carry their burdens and live like a horse upon grass and water he said also that in the space of time he continued with them he saw several experiments of their witchcraft for that once when two men had offended them by refusing to comply in taking their oath and obeying their orders they caused them immediately to be blindfolded and stopping them in holes of the earth up to their chin ran at them as if they had been dogs bellowing and barking as it were in their ears and when they had plagued them a while in this ridiculous manner they took them out and bid them remember how they offended any of the black nation again for if they did they should not escape so well as they had at present he had seen them also he said oblige carters to drive a good way out of the road and carry whatsoever venison or other thing they had plundered to the places where they would have them that the men were generally so frightened with their usage and so terrified with the oaths that they were obliged to swear that they seldom complained or even spoke of their bondage as to the fact for which they died elliot gave this account that in the morning when that fact was committed for which he died marshall kingshell and four others came to him and persuaded him to go to farnham holt and that he need not fear disobliging any gentleman in the country some of whom were very kind to this elliot they persuaded him that certain persons of fortune were concerned with them and would bear him harmless if he would go he owned that at last he consented to go with them but trembled all the way insomuch that he could hardly reach the holt while they were emerged in the business for which they came viz killing the deer the keepers came upon them elliot was wandered a considerable way from his companions after a fawn which he intended to send as a present to a young woman at guildford him therefore they quickly seized and bound and leaving him in that condition went in search of the rest of his associates it was not long before they came upon them the keepers were six the blacks were seven in number so they fell to it warmly with quarterstaffs the keepers unwilling to have lives taken advised them to retire but upon their refusing and marshall's firing a gun by which one of the keepers belonging to the lady howe was slain they discharged a blunderbuss and shattered the thigh of one barber amongst the blacks upon this three of his associates ran away and the other two marshall and kingshell were likewise taken and so the fray for the present ended elliot lay bound all the while within hearing and in the greatest agonies imaginable at the consideration that whatever blood was spilt he should be as much answerable for it as these who shed it in which he was not mistaken for the keepers returning after the fight was over carried him away bound and he never had his fetters off after till the morning of his execution he behaved himself very soberly quietly and with much seeming penitence and contrition he owned the justice of the law in punishing him and said he more especially deserved to suffer since at the time of committing this fact he was servant to a widow lady where he wanted nothing to make him happy or easy robert kingshell was twenty-six years old and lived in the same house with his parents being apprenticed to his brother a shoemaker his parents were very watchful over his behavior and sought by every method to prevent his taking to ill courses or being guilty of any debauchery whatever the night before this unhappy accident fell out as he and the rest of the family were sleeping in their beds 
barber made a signal at his chamber window it being then about eleven o'clock upon this king shell arose and got softly out of the window barber took him upon his horse and away they went to the holt twelve miles distant calling in their way upon henry marshall elliot and the rest of their accomplices he said it was eight o'clock in the morning before the keepers attacked them he owned they bid them retire and that he himself told them they would provided the bound man elliot was released and delivered into their hands but that proposition being refused the fight at once grew warm barber's thigh was broken and marshall killed the keeper with a shot being thereupon very hard pressed three of their companions ran away leaving him and marshall to fight it out elliot being already taken and barber disabled it was not long before they were in the same unhappy condition with their companions from the time of their being apprehended king shell laid aside all hopes of life and applied himself with great fervency and devotion to enable him in what alone remained for him to do viz dying decently henry marshall about thirty-six years of age the unfortunate person by whose hand the murder was committed seemed to be the least sensible of any of the evils he had done although such was the pleasure of almighty god that till the day before his execution he neither had his senses nor the use of his speech when he recovered it and the clergyman represented to him the horrid crime of which he had been guilty he was so far from showing any deep sense of that crime of shedding innocent blood that he made light of it said he might stand upon his own defence and was not bound to run away and leave his companions in danger this is the language he talked for the space of twenty-four hours before his death in which he enjoyed the use of speech and so far was he from thanking those who charitably offered him their admonitions that he said he had not forgot himself but had already taken care of what he thought necessary for his soul however he did not attempt in the least to prevaricate but fairly acknowledged that he committed the fact for which he died though nothing could oblige him to speak of it in any manner as if he was sorry for or repented of it farther than for having occasioned his own misfortunes so strong is the prejudice which vulgar minds acquire by often repeating to themselves and in company certain positions however ridiculous and false and sure nothing could be more so than for a man to fancy he had a right to imbrue his hands in the blood of another who was in the execution of his office and endeavouring to hinder the commission of an illegal act these of whom i have last spoken were all concerned together in the before-mentioned fact which was attended with murder but we are now to speak of the rest who were concerned in the felony only for which they with the above-mentioned parvin suffered of these were two brothers whose names were john and edward pink carters and partsmouth and always accounted honest and industrious fellows before this accident happened they did not however deny their being guilty but on the contrary ingeniously confessed the truth of what was sworn and mentioned some other circumstances that had been produced at the trial which attended their committing it they said they met parvin's housekeeper upon that road that they forced her to cut the throat of a deer which they had just taken upon bare forest gave her a dagger which they forced her to wear and to ride cross-legged with pistols before her in this dress they brought her to parvin's house upon the forest where they dined upon a haunch of venison feasted merrily and after dinner sent out two of their companions to kill more deer not in the king's forest but in waltham chase belonging to the bishop of winchester one of these two persons they called their king and the other they called lion neither of these brothers objected anything either to the truth of the evidence given against them or the justice of that sentence which had passed upon them only one insinuating that the evidence would not have been so strong against him and ansel if it had not been for running away with the witness's wife which so provoked him that they were sure they should not escape when he was admitted a witness these like the rest were hard to be persuaded that the things they had committed were any crimes in the eyes of god they said deer were wild beasts and they did not see why the poor had not as good a right to them as the rich however as the law condemned them to suffer they were bound to submit and in consequence of that notion 
behaved themselves very orderly, decently, and quietly while under sentence. James Ansell, alias Stephen Phillips, the seventh and last of these unhappy persons, was a man addicted to a worse and more profligate life than any of the rest had ever been. For he had held no settled employment, but had been a loose, disorderly person concerned in all sorts of wickedness for many years, both at Portsmouth, Guildford, and other country towns, as well as at London. Deer were not the only things that he had dealt in. Stealing and robbing on the highway had been formerly his employment, and in becoming a black, he did not, as the others, ascend in wickedness, but came down, on the contrary, a step lower. Yet this criminal, as his offenses were greater, so his sense of them was much stronger than in any of the rest, excepting Kingshell, for he gave over all manner of hopes of life and all concerns about it as soon as he was taken. Yet even he had no notion of making discoveries, unless they might be beneficial to himself, and though he owned the knowledge of twenty persons who were notorious offenders in the same kind, he absolutely refused to name them, since such naming would not procure himself a pardon. Talking to him of the duty of doing justice was beating the air. He said he thought there was no justice in taking away other people's lives, unless it was to save his own. Yet no sooner was he taxed about his own going on the highway than he confessed it, said he knew very well bills would have been preferred against him at Guilford Assizes, in case he had got off at the king's bench, but that he did not greatly value them. Though formerly he had been guilty of some facts in that way, yet they could not now all be proved, and he should have found it no difficult matter to have demonstrated his innocence of those then charged upon him, of which he was not really guilty, but owed his being thought so, to the profligate course of life he had for some time led, and his aversion to all honest employments. Bold as the whole gang of these fellows appeared, yet with what sickness, what with the apprehension of death, they were so terrified that not one of them, but Ansel, alias Phillips, was able to stand up or speak at the place of execution, many who saw them affirming that some of them were dead even before they were turned off. As an appendix to the melancholy history of these seven miserable and unhappy persons, I will add a letter written at that time by a gentleman of the county of Essex to his friend in London, containing a more particular account of the transactions of these people than I have seen anywhere else. Wherefore, without any further preface, I shall leave it to speak for itself. A Letter to Mr. C. D. in London Dear Sir, Amongst the odd accidents which you know have happened to me in the course of a very unsettled life, I don't know any which hath been more extraordinary or surprising than one I met with in going down to my own house when I left you last in town. You cannot but have heard of the Waltham Blacks, as they are called, a set of whimsical merry fellows that are so mad to run the greatest hazards for the sake of a haunch of venison and passing a jolly evening together. For my part, though the stories told of these people had reached my ears, yet I confess I took most of them for fables, and I thought that if there was truth in any of them it was much exaggerated. But experience, the mistress of fools, has taught me the contrary, by the adventure I am going to relate to you, which, though it ended well enough at last, I confess at first put me a good deal out of humor. To begin, then, my horse got a stone in his foot and therewith went so lame just as I entered the forest that I really thought his shoulder slipped. Finding it, however, impossible to get him along, I was even glad to take up a little blind alehouse, which I perceived had a yard and a stable behind it. The man of the house received me very civilly, but when he perceived my horse was so lame as scarce to be able to stir a step, I observed he grew uneasy. I asked him whether I could lodge there that night. He told me no he had no room. I desired him, then, to put something on my horse's foot, and let me sit up all night. For I was resolved not to spoil a horse, which cost me twenty guineas, by riding him in such a condition in which he was at present. The man made me no answer, and I proposed the same questions to the wife. She dealt more roughly and freely with me, 
and told me that truly I neither could nor should stay there, and was for hurrying her husband to get my horse out. However, on putting a crown into her hand and promising another for my lodging, she began to consider a little, and at last told me that there was indeed a little bed above stairs, on which she should order a clean pair of sheets to be put, for she was persuaded I was more of a gentleman than to take any notice of what I saw passed there. This made me more uneasy than I was before. I concluded now I was amongst a den of highwaymen, and expected nothing less than to be robbed and my throat cut. However, finding there was no remedy, I even set myself down and endeavored to be as easy as I could. By this time it was very dark, and I heard three or four horsemen alight and lead their horses into the yard. As the men returned and were coming into the room where I was, I overheard my landlord say, Indeed, brother, you need not be uneasy. I am positive the gentleman's a man of honor. To which I heard another voice reply, What could our death do to any stranger? Faith, I don't apprehend half the danger you do. I dare say the gentleman would be glad of our company, and we should be pleased with his. Come, hang fear, I'll lead the way. So said, so done, in they came, five of them, all disguised so effectually that I declare unless it were in the same disguise, I should not be able to distinguish any one of them. Down they sat, and he who I suppose was constituted their captain, Prohac Vis, accosted me with great civility, and asked me if I would honor them with my company to supper. I acknowledge I did not yet guess the profession of my new acquaintances, but supposing my landlord would be cautious of suffering either a robbery or a murder in his own house. I know not how, but by degrees my mind grew perfectly easy. About ten o'clock I heard a very great noise of horses, and soon after men's feet tramping in a room over my head. Then my landlord came down and informed us supper was just ready to go upon the table. Upon this we were all desired to walk up, and he whom I before called the captain presented me, with a humorous kind of ceremony, to a man more dignified than the rest who sat at the end of the table, telling me at the same time he hoped I would not refuse to pay my respects to Prince Urunoko, King of the Blacks. It then immediately struck into my head who those worthy persons were, into whose company I was thus accidentally fallen. I called myself a thousand blockheads for not finding out before, but the hurry of things, or to speak the truth, the fear I was in, prevented my judging even from the most evident signs. As soon as our awkward ceremony was over, supper was brought in. It consisted of eighteen dishes of venison in every shape, roasted, boiled with broth, hashed collops, pasties, humble pies, and a large haunch in the middle, larded. I easily saw that of three ordinary rooms of which the first floor of the house consisted, ours, by taking down the partitions, was very large, and the company in all twenty-one persons. At each of our elbows there was set a bottle of claret, and the man and woman of the house sat down at the lower end. Two or three of the fellows had good natural voices, and so the evening was spent as merrily as the rakes passed theirs in the king's arms, or the city apprentices with their master's maids at saddler's wells. About two the company seemed inclined to break up, having first assured me that they should take my company as a favor any Thursday evening, if I came that way. I confess I did not sleep all night with the reflecting what had passed, and could not resolve with myself whether these humorous gentlemen in masquerade were to be ranked under the denomination of knight-errants or plain robbers. This I must tell you, by the by, that with respect both to honesty and hardship, their life resembles much that of the hussars, since drinking is all their delight, and plundering their employment. Before I conclude my epistle, it is fit I should inform you that they did me the honor, with a design perhaps to have received me into their order, of acquainting me with those rules by which their society was governed. In the first place, their black prince assured me that their government was perfectly monarchical, and that when upon expeditions he had an absolute command. But in the time of peace, continued he, and at the table, government being no longer necessary, I condescend to eat and drink familiarly with my subjects as friends. We admit no man, 
continued he, into our society until he has been twice drunk with us, that we may be perfectly acquainted with his temper in compliance with the old proverb, women, children, and drunken folks speak truth. But if the person who sues to be admitted declares solemnly he was never drunk in his life, and it plainly appears to the society in such case, this rule is dispensed with, and the person before admission is only bound to converse with us a month. As soon as we have determined to admit him, he is then to equip himself with a good mare or gelding, a brace of pistols, and a gun of the size of this, to lie on the saddle-bow. Then he is sworn upon the horns over the chimney, and having a new name conferred by the society, and is thereby entered upon the roll, and from that day forward considered as a lawful member. He went on with abundance more of these wise institutions, which I think are not of consequence enough to tell you, and shall only remark one thing more, which is the phrase they make use of in speaking of one another, viz., he is a very honest fellow and one of us. For you must know it is the first article in their creed, and there is no sin in deer-stealing. In the morning, having given my landlady the other crown piece, I found her temper so much altered for the better, that in my conscience I believe she was not in the humor to have refused me anything, no, not even the last favor. And so, walking down the yard and finding my horse in pretty tolerable order, I speeded directly home, much in amaze at the new people I had discovered. You see, I have taken a great deal of pains in my letter. Pray, in return, let me have as long a one from you, and let me see if all your London rambles can produce such another adventure." I am yours, etc. Before I leave these people, I think it proper to acquaint my readers that their folly was not to be extinguished by a single execution. There were a great many young fellows of that same stamp, who were fools enough to forfeit their lives upon the same occasion. However, the humor did not run very long, though some of them were impudent enough to murder a keeper or two afterwards. Yet in the space of a twelvemonth the whole nation of blacks was extinguished, and these country rakes were contented to play the fool upon easier terms. The last blood that was shed on either side was that of a keeper's son at Old Windsor, whom some of these wise people fired at as he looked out of the window, by which means they drew on their own ruin, and that of several numerous families by which the country is put in such terror that we have heard nothing of them since though this act of Parliament, as I shall tell you, has been by construction extended to some other criminals, who were not strictly speaking of the same kind as the Waltham Blacks. The Black Act, 9 Geographical I, Caption 2, was repealed so late as 1827. End of Section 56《Section 57 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward, Section 57, The Life of Julian, a Black Boy and Incendiary. From speaking of artificial blacks, I come now to relate the unhappy death of one who was naturally of that color. This poor creature's Julian. At the time of his execution, he seemed to be about sixteen years of age. He had been stolen, while young, from his parents at Madras. He still retained his pagan ignorance both in respect to religion and our language. He was brought over by one Captain Dawes, who presented him to Mrs. Elizabeth Turner, where he was used with the greatest tenderness and kindness she often calling him to dance and sing after his manner before company, and he himself acknowledged that he had never been so happy in his life as he was there. 
Yet on a sudden he stole about twenty or thirty guineas, and then placing a candle under the sheets, left it burning to fire the house and consume the inhabitants in it. Of this upon proof and his own confession made before Sir Francis Forbes and Mr. Turner, he was convicted. While he remained under sentence, he was often heard to mumble in reproach and revengeful terms to himself. However, before his death he learned the Lord's Prayer, and when it was demanded whether he would be a Christian, he assented with great joy, which arose, it seems, from his having heard the common foolish opinion that when christened, blacks are to be set free. However christened he was, and received at his baptism the name of John, the place in which he was confined being very damp the boy having nothing to lie on but a coat caught so great a cold in his limbs that he almost lost the use of them before his death and continued in a state of great pain and weakness insomuch when he was told he must prepare for his execution he determined with himself to forestall it and for that purpose desired one of the prisoners to lend him a penknife, but the man, it seems, had more grace than to grant his request, and he ended his life at Tyburn, according to his sentence. End of section fifty seven. Recording by John Brandon. Section fifty eight of the Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals who have been condemned and executed for murder, the highway, housebreaking, street robberies, coining, or other offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Dale Grothman. Section 58. The Life of Abraham Duval, a Lottery Ticket Forger. Abram Duval, who had been a clerk to the lottery office, at last took it into his head to coin tickets for himself, and had such good luck therein that he at one time counterfeited a certificate for fifty-two pounds, twelve shillings, no pence, for seven blank lottery tickets in the year 1723. Two or three other facts of the same nature he perpetrated with the like success but happening to counterfeit two blank tickets of the lottery in the year in which he died they were discovered and he thereupon apprehended and tried at the old bailey on the first indictment for want of evidence he was acquitted upon which he behaved himself with great insolence lolling out his tongue at the court and told them he did not value the second indictment but therein he happened to be mistaken for the jury found him guilty of that indictment and thereupon he received a sentence of death accordingly notwithstanding the impudence with which he had treated the court at his trial he complained very loudly of their not showing him favor nay he even pretended that he had not justice done him this he grounded upon the score that the ticket he was indicted for was number thirty nine in the six hundred and fifty first course of payment now it seems that in a search of his brother-in-law parson's room the original ticket was found, though very much torn, from whence Duval would have had it taken to be no more than a duplicate, and much blamed his counsel for not insisting long enough upon this point, which, if he had done, Duval entertained a strong opinion that he could not have been convicted. The apprehension of this, and the uneasiness he was under with his irons, made him pass his last moments with the greatest unquietness and discontent. He said it was against the law to put a man in irons, that fettering English subjects, except they attempt to break prison, was altogether illegal. But after having raved at this rate for a small space, when he found it did him no good, and that there was no hope of a reprieve, he even began to settle himself to the performance of those duties which become a man in his sad condition, and when he did apply himself hitherto, nobody could appear to have a juster sense than he of that miserable and sad condition 
into which the folly and wickedness of his life had brought him it is certain the man did not want parts though sometimes he applied them to the worst of purposes and was cursed with an insolent and overbearing temper which hindered him from being loved or respected anywhere and which never did him any service but in the last moments of his life where if it had not been for the severity of his behavior julian the black boy would have been very troublesome both to him and to the other person who was under sentence at the same time at the place of execution duval owned the fact but wished the spectators to consider whether for all that he was legally convicted and so suffered at the thirtieth year of his age the end of section fifty eight the life of abram duval a lottery ticket forger Section 59 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward Section 59 The Life of Joseph Blake, alias Blueskin, a footpad and highwayman As there is impudence and wickedness enough in the lives of most malefactors to make persons of a sober education and behavior wonder at the depravity of human nature, so there are sometimes superlative rogues who in the infamous boldness of their behavior as far exceed the ordinary class of rogues as they do honest people and whenever such a monster as this appears in the world there are enough fools to gape at him and to make such a noise and outcry about his conduct as is sure to invite others of the gang to imitate the obstinacy of his deportment through that false love of fame which seems inherent to human nature amongst the number of these joseph blake better known by his nickname of blueskin always deserves to be remembered as one who thought wickedness the greatest achievement and studiously took the paths of infamy in order to become famous by birth he was a native of this city of london his parents being persons in tolerable circumstances kept him six years at school, where he did not learn half as much good from his master as he did evil from his schoolfellow, William Blewett, from whose lessons he copied so well that all his education signified nothing. When he came from school, he absolutely refused to go to any employment, but on the contrary, set up for a robber when he was scarce seventeen, but from that time to the day of his death was unsuccessful in all his undertakings, hardly ever committing the most trivial fact but he experienced for it, either the humanity of the mob or of the keepers of Bridewell, out of which, or some other prison, he could hardly keep his feet for a month together. He fell into the gang of Locke, Wilkinson, Carrick, Lincoln, and Daniel Carroll, which last, having so often been mentioned, perhaps my readers may be desirous to know what became of him. I shall therefore inform them that after Carrick and Maloney were executed for robbing Mr. Young, as has been before related, he fled home to his own native country of Ireland, where, for a while, making a great figure, till he had exhausted what little wealth he had brought over with him from England, he was obliged to go again upon the old method to supply him but street robbing being a very new thing at dublin it so alarmed that city that they never ceased pursuing him and one or two more who joined with him till catching them one night at their employment they pursued carroll so closely that he was obliged to come to a close engagement with a thief-taker so he was killed upon the spot but to return to blake alias blueskin being one night out with his gang they robbed one mr clark of eight shillings and a silver hilted sword 
just as candles were going to be lighted, and a woman, looking accidentally out of a window, perceived it and cried out, Thieves! Wilkinson fired a pistol at her, which, very luckily, upon her drawing in her head, grazed upon the stone of the window, and did no other mischief. Blake was also in the company of the same gang, when they attacked Captain Langley at the corner of Hyde Park Road as he was going to the camp. But the captain behaved himself so well that, notwithstanding, they shot several times through and through his coat, yet they were not able to rob him. Not long after this, Wilkinson, being apprehended, impeached a large number of persons, and with them Joseph Blake and William Locke. Blake hereupon made a fuller discovery than the other before Justice Blackerby, in which information there was contained no less than seventy robberies, upon which he also was admitted a witness. And having named Wilkinson, Lincoln, Carrick, Carroll, and himself to have been the five persons who murdered Peter Martin, the Chelsea pensioner by the park wall, Wilkinson was apprehended, tried, and convicted, notwithstanding the information he had before given, which was thereby totally set aside, so that Blake himself became now an evidence against the rest of his companions, and discovered about a dozen robberies which they had committed. Amongst these there was one very remarkable one. Two gentlemen in hunting caps were together in a chariot on the Hampstead Road, and they took from them two gold watches, rings, seals, and other things to a considerable value. Junks, alias Levy, laid his pistol down by the gentleman all the while he searched him. Yet he wanted either the courage or the presence of mind to seize and prevent their losing things of so great value. Not long after this, Oki, Junks, and this Blake stopped a single man with a link before him in Fig Lane and he, not surrendering so easily as they expected, Junks and Oki beat him over the head with their pistols, and then left him wounded in a terrible condition, taking from him one guinea and one penny. A very short time after this, Junks, Oki, and Flood were apprehended and executed for robbing Colonel Cope and Mr. Young of that very watch for which Carrick and Maloney had been before executed, Joseph Blake being the evidence against them. After this hanging work of his companions, he thought himself not only entitled to liberty, but reward. Herein, however, he was mightily mistaken, for not having surrendered willingly and quietly, but being taken after long resistance, and when he was much wounded, there did not seem to be the least foundation for this confident demand, he still remaining a prisoner in the Wood Street Compter, obstinately refusing to be transported for seven years, but insisting that as he had given evidence, he ought to have his liberty. However, the magistrates were of another opinion, until at last by procuring two men to be bound for his good behavior, he was carried before a wealthy alderman of the city, and there discharged. At which time, somebody there present, asking how long time might be given him before they should see him again at the Old Bailey, a gentleman made answer in about three sessions, in which time it seems he guessed very right. For the third session from thence, Blake was indeed brought to the bar. For no sooner were his feet at liberty, but his hands were employed in robbing, and having picked up Jack Shepherd for a companion, they went out together to search for prey in the fields. Near the halfway house to Hampstead, they met with one Pargeter, a man pretty much in liquor, whom immediately Blake knocked down into the ditch, where he must have inevitably perished if John Shepherd had not kept his head above the mud with great difficulty. For this fact, the next sessions after it happened, the two brothers Brightwell in the guards were tried, and if a number of men had not sworn them to have been upon duty at the time the robbery was committed, they had certainly been convicted, the evidence of the prosecutor being direct and full. 
Through the grief of this, the elder Brightwell died a week after he was released from his confinement, and so did not live to see his innocence fully cleared by the confession of Blake. A very short space after this, Blake and his companion Shepherd committed the burglary together in the house of Mr. Kneebone, where Shepherd, getting into the house, let in Blake at the back door and stripped the house of a considerable value. For this, both Shepherd and he were apprehended, and the sessions before Blake was convicted, his companion received sentence of death, but at the time Blake was taken up, he had made his escape out of the condemned hold. He behaved with great impudence at his trial, and when he found nothing would save him, he took the advantage of Jonathan Wilde coming to speak with him to cut the said Wilde's throat, making a large gash from the ear beyond the windpipe. Of this wound, Wilde languished a long time, and happy had it been for him if Blake's wound had proved fatal, for then Jonathan had escaped death by a more dishonorable wound in the throat than that of a penknife. But the number of his crimes and the spleen of his enemies procured him a worse fate. Whatever Wilde might deserve of others, he seems to have merited better usage from this Blake, for while he continued a prisoner in the Compter, Jonathan was at the expense of curing his wound, allowing him three shillings and sixpence a week, and, after his last misfortune, promised him a good coffin, actually furnishing him with money to support him in Newgate, and several good books, if he would have made any use of them. But, because he freely declared to Blueskin that there was no hopes of getting him transported, the bloody villain determined to take away his life, and was so far from showing any signs of remorse when he was brought up again to Newgate, that he declared, if he had thought of it before, he would have provided such a knife as should have cut his head off. At the time that he received sentence, there was a woman also condemned, and they being placed as usual in what is called the bail dock at the Old Bailey, Blake offered such rudeness to the woman that she cried out and alarmed the whole bench. All the time he lay under condemnation, he appeared utterly thoughtless and insensible of his approaching fate, though from the cutting of Wilde's throat and some other barbarities of the same nature he acquired amongst the mob the character of a brave fellow, yet he was in himself but a mean-spirited, timorous wretch, and never exerted himself but either through fury and despair. His cowardice appealed manifestly in his behavior at his death. He wept much at the chapel in the morning he was to die, and though he drank deeply to drive away fear, yet at the place of execution he wept again, trembled, and showed all the signs of a timorous confusion, as well he might, who had lived wickedly and trifled with his repentance to the grave. There was nothing in his person extraordinary. A dapper, well-set fellow of great strength and great cruelty, equally detested by the sober part of the world, for his audacious wickedness of his behavior, and despised by his companions for the villainies he committed even against them. He was executed in the twenty-eighth year of his age, on the 11th of November, 1724. End of section 59. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 60 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed Volume 1 Edited by Arthur L. Hayward Section 60 The Life of the Famous John Shepherd Footpad, Housebreaker, and Prison Breaker 
Amongst the prodigies of ingenious wickedness and artful mischief which have surprised the world in our time, perhaps none has made so great a noise as John Shepherd, the malefactor of whom we are now to speak. His father's name was Thomas Shepherd, who was by trade a carpenter and lived in Spitalfields, a man of an extraordinary good character, and who took all the care his narrow circumstances would allow that his family might be brought up in the fear of God, and in just notions of their duty towards their neighbor. Yet he was so unhappy in his children that both his son John and another took to evil courses, and both in their turns have been convicted at the bar at the Old Bailey. After the father's death, his widow did all she could to get this unfortunate son of hers admitted into Christ's hospital, but, failing of that, she got him bred up at a school in Bishopsgate Street, where he learned to read. He might, in all probability, have got a good education if he had not been too soon removed, being put out to a trade, that is, that of a cane chairmaker, who used him very well, and with whom probably he might have lived honestly. But, his mother dying a short time afterwards, he was put to another, a much younger man, who used him so harshly that in a little time he ran away from him and was put to another master, one Mr. Wood, in Wick Street. From his kindness and that of Mr. Kneebone, whom he robbed, he was taught to write and had many other favors done by that gentleman whom he so ungratefully treated. But good usage or bad, it was grown all alike to him now. He had given himself up to all the sensual pleasures of low life. Drinking all day, and getting to some impudent and notorious strumpet at night, was the whole course of his life for a considerable space, without the least reflection on what a miserable fate it might bring upon him here, much less the judgment that might be passed upon him hereafter. Amongst the chief of his mistresses, there was one Elizabeth Lyon, commonly called Edgeworth Bess, the impudence of whose behavior was shocking even to the greatest part of Shepherd's companions, but it charmed him so much that he suffered her for a while to direct him in everything, and she was the first who engaged him in taking base methods to obtain money wherewith to purchase baser pleasures. This lion was a large masculine woman, and Shepherd a very little slight-limbed lad, so that whenever he had been drinking and came to her quarrelsome, Bess often beat him into better temper, though Shepherd, upon other occasions, manifested his wanting neither courage nor strength. Repeated quarrels, however, between Shepherd and his mistress, as it does often with people of better rank, created such coldness that they spoke not together sometimes for a month. But our robber could not be so long without some fair one to take up his time and drive his thoughts from the consideration of his crimes and the punishment which might one day befall them. The creature he picked out to supply the place of Betty Lyon was one Mrs. Maggot, a woman somewhat less boisterous in her temper, but full as wicked. She had a very great contempt for Shepherd, and only made use of him to go and steal money, or what might yield money, for her to spend in company that she liked better. One night, when Shepherd came to her and told her he had pawned the last thing he had for half a crown, "'Prithee,' says she, "'don't tell me such melancholy stories, but think how you may get more money. I have been in Whitehorse Yard this afternoon.' There's a peace broker there worth a great deal of money. He keeps his cash in a drawer under the counter, and there's abundance of good things in his shop that would be fit for me to wear. A word, you know, to the wise is enough. Let me see now how soon you'll put me in possession of them. This had the effect she desired. Shepherd left her about one o'clock in the morning, went to the house she talked of, took up the cellar window bars, and from thence entered the shop, which he plundered of money and goods to the amount of twenty-two pounds. He brought it to his doxy the same day before she was stirring, 
who thereupon appeared very satisfied with his diligence and helped him in a short time to squander what he had so dearly earned however he still retained some affection for his old favorite bess lyon who being taken up for some of her tricks was committed to st giles roundhouse shepherd going to see her there broke the doors open beat the keeper and like a true knight-errant set his distressed paramour at liberty this heroic act got him so much reputation amongst the fair ladies in drury lane that there was nobody of his profession so much esteemed by them as john shepherd with his brother thomas who had taken to the same trade observing and being in himself in tolerable estimation with that debauched part of the sex he importuned some of them to speak to his brother john to lend him a little money and for the future to allow him to go out robbing with him to both these propositions jack being a kind brother as he himself said consented at the first word and from thenceforward the two brothers were always of one party jack having as he impudently phrased it lent him forty shillings to put himself in a proper plight and soon after their being together having broke open an alehouse where they got a tolerable booty in a high fit of generosity john presented it all to his brother as soon after he did clothes to a very considerable extent so that the young man might not appear among the damsels of drury unbecoming mr shepherd's brother about three weeks after their coming together they broke open a linen draper's shop near clare market where the brothers made good use of their time for they were not in the house above a quarter of an hour before they made a shift to strip it of fifty pounds but the younger brother acting imprudently in disposing of some of the goods he was detected and apprehended upon which the first thing he did was to make a full discovery to impeach his brother and as many of his confederates as he could jack was very quickly apprehended upon his brother's information and was committed by justice parry to the roundhouse for further examination but instead of waiting for that jack began to examine as well as he could the strength of the place of his confinement which being much too weak for a fellow of his capacity he marched off before night and committed a robbery into the bargain but vowed to be revenged on tom who had so basely behaved himself as jack phrased it towards so good a brother however that information going off jack went on in his old way as usual one day in may he and f benson being in leicester fields benson attempted to get a gentleman's watch but missing his pull the gentleman perceived it and raised a mob shepherd passing briskly to save his companion was apprehended in his stead and being carried before justice walters was committed to new prison where the first sight he saw was his old companion bess lyon who had found her way thither upon a like errand jack who now saw himself beset with danger began to exert all his little cunning which was indeed his masterpiece for this purpose he applied first to benson's friends who were in good circumstances hoping by their mediation to make the matter up but in this he miscarried then he attempted a slight information but the justice to whom he sent it perceiving how trivial a thing it was and guessing well at the drift thereof refused it whereupon shepherd when driven to his last shift communicated his resolution to bess lyon they laid their heads together the fore part of the night and then went to work to break out which they effected by force and got safe off to one of bess lyon's old lodgings where she kept him secret for some time frightening him with stories of great searches being made after him in order to detain him from conversing with any other woman but jack being not naturally timorous and having a strong inclination to be out again in his old way with his companions it was not long before he gave her the slip 
and lodged himself with another of his female acquaintances in a little by-court near the Strand. Here one Charles Grace desired to become an associate with him. Jack was very ready to take any young fellow in as a partner of his villainies, and Grace told him that his reason for doing such things was to keep a beautiful woman without the knowledge of his relations. Shepherd and he, therefore, getting into the acquaintance of one Anthony Lamb, an apprentice of Mr. Carter, near St. Clement's Church, they inveigled the young man to consent to let them in to rob his master's house. He accordingly performed it, and they took from Mr. Barton, who lodged there, to a very considerable value. But Grace and Shepherd, quarrelling about the division, Shepherd wounded Grace in a violent manner, and on this quarrel, betraying one another, they were all taken, Shepherd only escaping. But the misfortune of poor Lamb, who had been drawn in, being so very young, so far prevailed upon several gentlemen who knew him, that they not only prevailed to have his sentence mitigated to transportation, but also furnished him with all necessaries, and procured an order that on his arrival there he should not be sold as the other felons were, but that he should be left at liberty, to provide for himself as well as he could. It seems that Shepherd's gang, which consisted of himself, his brother Tom, Joseph Blake, alias Blueskin, Charles Grace, James Sykes, to whose name his companions tacked their two favorite syllables, hell and fury, not knowing how to dispose of the goods they had taken, made use of one William Field for that purpose, who, Shepherd in his ludicrous style, used to characterize thus, that he was a fellow, wicked enough to do anything, but his want of courage permitted him to do nothing but carry on the trade he did, which was that of selling stolen goods when put into his hands. But Blake and Shepherd, finding Field somewhat dilatory, not thinking it always safe to trust him, they resolved to hire a warehouse and lodge their goods there, which, accordingly, they did, near the horse ferry in Westminster. There they placed what they had taken out of Mr. Kneebone's house, and the goods made a great show there, whence the people in the neighborhood really took them for honest persons, who had so great a wholesale business on their hands as occasioned their taking a place, where they by convenient for the water. Field, however, importuned them, having got sent they had such a warehouse, that he might go and see the goods, pretending that he had it just now in his power to sell them at a very great price. They accordingly carried him thither and showed him the things. Two or three days afterwards, though he had not courage enough to rob anybody else, Field ventured to break open the warehouse and took every rag that had been lodged there, and not long after, Shepherd was apprehended for the fact and tried at the next sessions of the Old Bailey. His appearance there was very mean, and all the defense he offered to make was that Jonathan Wilde had helped to dispose of part of the goods, and he thought it was very hard that he should not share in the punishment. The court took little notice of so insignificant a plea, and, sentence being passed upon him, he hardly made a sensible petition for the favor of the court in the report, but behaved throughout as a person either stupid or foolish, so far was he from appearing in any degree likely to make the noise he afterwards did. When put into the condemned hold, he prevailed upon one Fowles, who was also under sentence, to lift him up to the iron spikes placed over the door which looks into the lodge. A woman of large make, attending without, and two others standing behind her in riding hoods, Jack no sooner got his head and shoulders through between the iron spikes than by a sudden spring his body followed with ease, and the women taking him down gently, he was without suspicion of the keepers, although some of them were drinking at the upper end of the lodge, conveyed safely out of the lodge door, and getting a hackney coach, went clear off before there was the least notice of his escape, which, when it was known, 
very much surprised the keepers, who never dreamt of an attempt of that kind before. As soon as John breathed the fresh air, he went again briskly to his old employment, and the first thing he did was to find out one page, a butcher of his acquaintance in Clare Market, who dressed him up in one of his frocks, and then went with him upon the business of raising money. No sooner had they set out, but Shepherd, remembering one Mr. Martin, a watchmaker near the Castle Tavern in Fleet Street, he prevailed upon his companion to go thither, and, screwing a gimlet fast into the post of the door, they then tied the knocker thereto with a spring, and then, boldly breaking the windows, they snatched three watches before a boy that was in the shop could open the door, and so marched clear off, Shepherd having the impudence upon this occasion to pass underneath Newgate. However, he did not long enjoy his liberty, for strolling about Finchley Common, he was apprehended and committed to Newgate, and was put immediately in the stone room, where they put him on a heavy pair of irons, and then stapled him fast down to the floor. Being left there alone in the session's time, most of the people in the jail then attending at the old bailey, with a crooked nail he opened the lock, and by that means got rid of his chain, and went directly to the chimney in the room, where, with incessant working, he got out a couple of stones, and by that means climbed up into a room called the Red Room, where nobody had been lodged for a considerable time. Here he threw down a door, which one would have thought impossible to have been done by the strength of man, though with ever so much noise. From hence, with a great deal to do, he forced his passage into the chapel. There he broke a spike off the door, forcing open by its help four other doors. Getting at last upon the leads, he from thence descended gently, by the help of the blanket on which he lay, for which he went back through the whole prison, upon the leads of Mr. Bird, a turner who lives next door to Newgate, and, looking in at the garret window, he saw the maid going to bed. As soon as he thought she was asleep, he stepped downstairs, went through the shop, opened the door, then into the street, leaving the door open behind him. In the morning, when the keepers were in search after him, hearing of this circumstance by the watchman, they were then perfectly satisfied of the method by which he went off. However, they were obliged to publish a reward, and to make the strictest enquiry after him, some foolish people having propagated a report that he had not got out without connivance. In the meanwhile, Shepherd found it a very difficult thing to get rid of his irons, being obliged to lurk about and lie hid near a village not far from town, until, with much ado, he fell upon a method of procuring a hammer and taking his irons off. He was no sooner freed from the encumbrance that remained upon him than he came secretly into the town that night and robbed Mr. Rawlins' house, a pawnbroker in Drury Lane. Here he got a very large booty, and amongst other things, a very handsome black suit of clothes and a gold watch. Being dressed in this manner, he carried the rest of the goods and valuable effects to two women, one of whom was a poor young creature whom Shepherd had seduced and who was imprisoned on this account. No sooner had she taken care of the booty, but he went among his old companions, pickpockets and whores, in Drury Lane and Clare Market. There, being accidentally espied fuddling at a little brandy shop by a boy belonging to an alehouse who knew him very well, the lad immediately gave information, upon which he was apprehended and reconducted with a vast mob to his old mansion house of Newgate, being so much intoxicated with liquor that he was hardly sensible of his miserable fate. However, they took effectual care to prevent a third escape, never suffering him to be alone a moment, which, as it put the keepers to a great expense, 
they took care to pay themselves with the money they took of all who came to see him. In this last confinement, it was that Mr. Shepherd and his adventures became the sole topic of conversation about town. Numbers flocked daily to behold him, and, far from being displeased at being made a spectacle of, he entertained all who came with the greatest gaiety that could be. He acquainted them with all his adventures, related each of his robberies in the most ludicrous manner, and endeavored to set off every circumstance of his flagitious life, as well as his capacity would give him leave, which, to say truth, was excellent at cunning and buffoonery and nothing else. Nor were the crowds that thronged to Newgate on this occasion made up of the dregs of the people only, for then there would have been no wonder. But instead of that, they were persons of the first distinction, and not a few, even dignified with titles. Tis certain that the noise made about him, and this curiosity of persons of so high a rank, was a very great misfortune to the poor wretch himself, who, from these circumstances, began to conceive grand ideas of himself, as well as strong hopes of pardon, which encouraged him to play over all his airs and divert as many as thought it worth their while, by their presence, to prevent a dying man from considering his latter end, who, instead of repenting of his crimes, gloried in rehearsing them. Yet, when Shepherd came up to chapel, it was observed that all his gaiety was laid aside, and he both heard and assisted with great attention at divine service, though upon other occasions he avoided religious discourse as much as he could, and, depending upon the petitions he had made to several noblemen to intercede with the king for mercy, he seemed rather to aim at diverting his time until he received a pardon than to improve the few days he had to prepare himself for his last. On the 10th of November, 1724, he was by certiorari removed to the bar of the court of King's Bench at Westminster. An affidavit being made that he was the same John Shepherd mentioned in the record of conviction before him, Mr. Justice Powis awarded judgment against him, and a rule was made for his execution on the 16th. Such was the unaccountable fondness this criminal had for life, and so unwilling was he to lose all hopes of preserving it, that he framed in his mind resolutions of cutting the rope when he should be bound in the cart, thinking thereby to get amongst the crowd, and so into Lincoln's Inn Fields, and from thence to the Thames. For this purpose he had provided a knife, which was with great difficulty taken from him by Mr. Watson, who was to attend him to death. Nay, his hopes were carried even beyond hanging, for when he spoke to a person to whom he gave what money he had remaining, out of the large presents he had received from those who came to divert themselves at Shepherd's Show, or Newgate Fair, he most earnestly entreated him that as soon as possible his body might be taken out of the hearse which was provided for him, put into a warm bed, and, if it were possible, some blood taken from him, for he was in great hopes that he might be brought to life again. But if he was not, he desired him to defray the expenses of his funeral and return the overplus to his poor mother. Then he resumed his usual discourse about his robberies, and, in the last moments of his life, endeavored to divert himself from the thoughts of death. Yet so uncertain and various was he in his behavior that he told one whom he had a great desire to see on the morning that he died that he had then a satisfaction at his heart as if he were going to enjoy two hundred pounds per annum. At the place of execution to which he was conveyed in a cart with iron handcuffs on he behaved himself very gravely, confessing his robbery of Mr. Phillips and Mrs. Cook, but denied that he and Joseph Blake had William Field in their company when they broke open the house of Mr. Kneebone. After this, he submitted to his fate on the 16th of November, 1724, much pitied by the mob. 
End of section 60. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 61 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward, Section 61, The Life of Louis Houssart, the French Barber, a Murderer. As there is not any crime more shocking to human nature, or more contrary to all laws, human and divine, than murder, so, perhaps, there has been few committed in these last years accompanied with more odd circumstances than that for which this criminal suffered. Louis Houssart was born at Sedan, a town in Champagne, in the Kingdom of France. His own paper says that he was bred a surgeon and qualified for that business. However that were, he was here no better than a penny barber, only that he let blood and thereby got a little and not much money. As to the other circumstances of his life, my memoirs are not full enough to assist me in speaking thereto. All I can say of him is that while his wife, Anne Rondeau, was living, he married another woman, and the night of the marriage, before sitting down to supper, he went out a little space. During the interval between that and his coming in, it was judged from the circumstances that I shall mention hereafter, that he cut the throat of the poor woman who was his first wife with a razor. For this being apprehended, he was tried at the Old Bailey, but for want of proof sufficient was acquitted. Not long after, he was indicted for bigamy, i.e. for marrying his second wife, his first having been yet alive. Scarce making any defense upon this indictment, he was found guilty. He said thereupon it was no more than he expected, and that he did not trouble himself to preserve so much as his reputation in this respect. For, in the first place, he knew they were resolved to convict him. And in the next, he said, where there was no fault, there was no shame. That his first wife was a Socinian, an irrational creature, and was entitled to the advantages of no nation nor people, because she was no Christian, and, accordingly, the scripture says, with such a one, have no conversation, no, not so much as to eat with them. But an appeal was lodged against him by Solomon Rondeau, brother and heir to Anne, his wife, yet that appearing to be defective, it was quashed, and he charged upon another, whereunto, joining issue upon six points, they came to be tried at the Old Bailey, where the following circumstances appeared upon the trial. First, that at the time he was at supper at his new wife's house, he started on a sudden, looked aghast, and seemed to be very much frightened. A little boy deposed that the prisoner gave him money to go to his own house in a little court, and fetch the mother of the deceased Anne Rondeau to a gentleman who would be at such a place and wait for her. When the mother returned from that place and found nobody wanting her, or that had wanted her, she was very much out of humor at the boys calling her, but that quickly gave way to the surprise of finding her daughter murdered as soon as she entered the room. This boy who called her was very young, yet out of the number of persons who were in Newgate, he singled out Louis Houssart and declared that he was the only man among them who gave him money to go on the errand for old Mistress Rondeau. Upon this and several other corroborating proofs, the jury found him guilty, upon which he arraigned the justice of a court which hitherto had been preserved without a taint, declaring that he was innocent and that they might punish him if they would, 
but they could not make him guilty, and much more to the like effect. But the court were not troubled with that, so he scarce endeavored to make any other defense. While in the condemned hold amongst the rest of the criminals, he behaved himself in a very odd manner, insisted upon it that he was innocent of the fact laid to his charge, threw out most opprobious language against the court that condemned him, and when he was advised to lay aside such eats of passionate expressions, he said he was sorry he did not more fully expose British justice upon the spot at the Old Bailey, and that now, since they had tied up his hands from acting, he would at least have satisfaction in saying what he pleased. When this Usal was first apprehended, he appeared to be very much affected with his condition, was continually reading good books, praying and meditating, and showing the utmost signs of a heart full of concern and under the greatest emotions. But after he had once been convicted, it made a thorough change in his temper. He quite laid aside all the former gravity of his temper, and gave way, in the contrary, to a very extraordinary spirit of obstinacy and unbelief. He puzzled himself continually, and if Mr. Deval, who was then under sentence, would have given leave, attempted to puzzle him too, as to the doctrines of a future state, and an identical resurrection of the body. He said he could not be persuaded of the truth thereof in a literal sense, that when the individual frame of flesh which he bore about him was once dead, and from being flesh became again clay, he did not either conceive or believe that it, after lying in the earth, or disposed of otherwise, perhaps for the space of a thousand years, should at the last day be reanimated by the soul which possessed it now, and become answerable even to eternal punishment, for crimes committed so long ago. It was, he said, also little agreeable to the notions he entertained of the infinite mercy of God, and therefore he chose rather to look upon such doctrines as errors received from education than torment and afflict himself with the terrors which must arise from such a belief. But after he had once answered as well as he could these objections, Mr. Deval refused to hearken a second time to any such discourses, and was obliged to have recourse to harsh language to oblige him to desist. In the meanwhile, his brother came over from Holland, on the news of this dreadful misfortune, and went to make him a visit in the place of his confinement while under condemnation, going to condole with him on the heavy weight of his misfortunes upon which, instead of receiving the kindness of his brother in the manner it deserved, Usar began to make light of the affair, and treated the death of his wife and his own confinement in such a manner that his brother, leaving him abruptly, went back to Holland more shocked at the brutality of his behavior than grieved for the misfortune which had befallen him. It being a considerable space of time that Usa lay in confinement in Newgate and even in the condemned hold, he had there, of course, abundance of companions. But of them all, he affected none so much as John Shepherd, with whom he had abundance of merry and even loose discourse. Once, particularly, when the sparks flew very quickly out of the charcoal fire, he said to Shepherd, See, see, I wish these were so many bullets that might beat the prison down about our ears, and then I might die like Samson. It was near a month before he was called up to receive sentence, after which he made no scruple of saying that since they had found him guilty of throat-cutting, they should not lie, he would verify their judgment by cutting his own throat. Upon which when some who were in the same sad state with himself pointed out to him how great a crime self-murder was, he immediately made answer that he was satisfied it was no crime at all, and upon this he fell to arguing in favor of the mortality of the soul, as if certain that it died with the body 
endeavoring to cover his opinions with false glosses on that text in Genesis, where it is said that God breathed into man a living soul. From hence, he would have inferred that when a man ceased to live, he totally lost that soul, and when it was asked of him where then it went, he said he did not know, nor did it concern him much. The standers by, who, notwithstanding their profligate course of life, had a natural abhorrence of this theoretical impiety, reproved him in very sharp terms for making use of such expression, upon which he replied, I, would you have me believe all the strange notions that are taught by the parsons, that the devil is a real thing, that our good God punishes souls for ever and ever, that hell is full of flames from material fire, and that this body of mine shall feel it? Well, you may believe it if you please, but it is so with me that I cannot. Sometimes, however, he would lay aside these skeptical opinions for a time, talk in another strain, and appear mightily concerned at the misfortunes he had drawn upon his second wife and child. He would then speak of providence, and the decrees of God, with much seeming submission, would own that he had been guilty of many and grievous offenses, say that the punishment of God was just, and desire the prayers of the minister of the place and those that were about him. When he reflected on the grief it would give his father, near ninety years old, to hear of his misfortunes, and that his son should be shamefully executed for the murder of his wife, he was seen to shed tears and to appear very much affected. But as soon as these thoughts were a little out of his head, he resumed his former temper and was continually asking questions in relation to the truth of the gospel dispensation and the doctrines therein taught of rewards and punishments after this life. Being a Frenchman and not perfectly versed in our language, a minister of the Reformed Church of that nation was prevailed upon to attend him. Usa received him with tolerable civility, seemed pleased that he should pray by him, but industriously waved aside all discourses of his guilt, and even fell out into violent passions if confession was pressed upon him as a duty. In this strange way, he consumed the time allowed him to prepare for another world, the day before his execution, he appeared more than ordinarily attentive at the public devotions in the chapel. A sermon was then made with particular regard to that fact for which he was to die. He heard that also seemingly with much care, but when he was asked immediately after to unburden his conscience in respect of the death of his wife, he not only refused it, but also expressed a great indignation that he should be tormented as he called it, to confess a thing of which he was not guilty. In the evening of that day, the foreign minister and he whose duty it was to attend him both waited upon him at night in order to discourse with him on those strange notions he had of the mortality of the soul and a total cessation of being after this life. But when they came to speak to him to this purpose, he said they might spare themselves any arguments upon that head, for he believed a God and a resurrection as firmly as they did. They then discoursed to him of the nature of a sufficient repentance, and of the duty incumbent upon him to confess that great crime for which he was condemned, and thereby give glory unto God. He fell at this into his old temper, and said with some passion, If you will pray with me, I'll thank you and pray with you as long as you please, but if you come only to torture me with my guilt, I desire you would let me alone altogether. His lawyers, having pretty well instructed him in the nature of an appeal, and he coming thereby to know that he was now under sentence of death, at the suit of the subject and not of the king, he was very assiduous to learn where it was he was to apply for a reprieve, but finding it was the relations of his deceased wife from whom he was to expect it, he laid aside all those hopes, as conceiving it rightly a thing impossible to prevail upon people to spare his life, 
who had almost undone themselves in prosecuting him. In the morning of the day of execution, he was very much disturbed at being refused the sacrament, which, as the minister told him, could not be given him by the canon without his confession. Yet this did not prevail. He said he would die without receiving it, as he had before answered a French minister who said, Louis Houssart, since you are condemned on full evidence, and I see no reason but to believe you guilty, I must, as a just pastor, inform you that if you persist in this denial and die without confession, you can look for nothing but to be d to which Usa replied, You must look for damnation to yourself for judging me guilty when you know nothing of the matter. This confused frame of mind he continued in until he entered the cart for his execution, persisting in a like declaration of innocence all the way he went, though sometimes intermixed with short prayers to God to forgive his manifold sins and offenses. At the place of execution, he turned very pale and grew very sick. The ministers told him they would not pray by him unless he would confess the murder for which he died. He said he was very sorry for that, but if they would not pray by him, he could not help it. He would not confess what he was totally ignorant of. Even at the moment of being tied up, he persisted, and when such exhortations were again repeated, he said, Pray do not torment me. Pray cease troubling me. I tell you I will not make myself worse than I am. And so saying, he gave up the ghost without any private prayer, when left alone or calling upon God or Christ to receive his spirit. He delivered to the minister of Newgate, however, a paper, the copy which follows, from whence my readers will receive a more exact idea of the man from this, his draft of himself, than from any picture I can draw. The paper delivered by Louis Houssart at his death. I, Louis Houssart, am forty years old, and was born in Sedan, a town in Champagne, near Boulonnois. I have left France above fourteen years. I was apprenticed to a surgeon at Amsterdam, and after examination was allowed by the college to be qualified for that business, so that I intended to go on board a ship as surgeon, but I could never have my health at sea. I dwelt some time at Maastricht, in the Dutch Brabant, where my aged father and brother now dwell. I traveled through Holland and was in almost every town. My two sisters are in France, and also many of my relations, for the earth has scarce any family more numerous than ours. Seven or eight years have I been in London, and here I met with Anne Rondeau, who was born at the same village with me, and therefore I loved her. After I had left her, she wrote to me, and said she would reveal a secret. I promised her to be secret, and she told me she had not been chaste, and the consequence of it was upon her, upon which I gave her my best help and assistance. Since she is dead, I hope her soul is happy. Louis Houssart End of section 61 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 62 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward. Section 62. The Life of Charles Towers, a Minter in Wapping. Notwithstanding it must be apparent, even to a very ordinary understanding, that the law must be executed both in civil and criminal cases, and that without such execution those who live under its protection would be very unsafe. Yet it happens so that those who feel the smart of its judgment, 
though drawn upon them by their own misdeeds, follies, or misfortunes which the law of man cannot remedy or prevent, are always clamoring against its supposed severity, and making dreadful complaints of the hardships they from thence sustain. This disposition hath engaged numbers under these unhappy circumstances to attempt screening themselves from the rigor of the laws by sheltering in certain places where, by virtue of their own authority, or rather necessities, they set up a right of exemption, and endeavor to establish a power of preserving those who live within certain limits from being prosecuted according to the usual course of the law. Anciently, indeed, there were several sanctuaries which depended on the Roman Catholic religion, and which were, of course, destroyed when popery was done away by law. However, those who had sheltered themselves in them kept up such exemption, and by force withstood whatever civil officers attempted to execute process for debt, and that so vigorously that at length they seemed to have established by prescription what was directly against law. These pretended privileged places increased at last to such an extent that in the ninth year of King William, the legislature was obliged to make provision by a clause in an act of Parliament requiring the sheriffs of London, Middlesex, and Surrey, the head bailiff of the Duchy Liberty, or the bailiff of Surrey, under the penalty of one hundred pounds, to execute with the assistance of the posse comitatus any writ or warrant directed to them for seizing any person within any pretended privilege place, such as White Friars, the Savoy, Salisbury Court, Ram Alley, Mitre Court, Fuller's Rents, Baldwin's Gardens, Montague Close, or the Minories, Mint, Clink, or Dead Man's Place. At the same time, they ordered the assistance for executing the law of any who obey the sheriff or other person or persons in such places as aforesaid, with the very great penalties upon persons who attempt to rescue persons from the hands of justice in such place. This law had a very good effect, with respect to all places, excepting those within the jurisdiction of the Mint, though not without some struggle. There, however, they still continued to keep up those privileges they had assumed, and, accordingly, did maintain them by so far misusing persons who attempted to execute processes amongst them by ducking them in ditches, dragging them through privies or lay stalls, accompanied by a number of people dressed up in frightful habits, who were summoned upon blowing a horn. All which at last became so very great a grievance that the legislature was again forced to interpose, and by an act of the ninth of the late king, the mint, as it was commonly called, situated in the parish of St. George's, Southwark, in the county of Surrey, was taken away, and the punishment of transportation, and even death, inflicted upon such who should persist in maintaining their pretended privileges. Yet so far did the government extend its mercy as to suffer all those who, at the time of passing the act, were actually shelterers in the mint, provided that they made a just discovery of their effects, to be discharged from any imprisonment of their persons for any debts contracted before that time. By this act of Parliament, the privilege of the mint was totally taken away and destroyed. The persons who had so many years supported themselves therein were dissipated and dispersed, but many of them got again into debt, and associating themselves with other persons in the same condition, with unparalleled impudence, they attempted to set up, towards Wapping, a new privileged jurisdiction under the title of the Seven Cities of Refuge. In this attempt, they were much furthered and directed by one Major Santlo, formerly a Justice of Peace, but, being turned out of commission, he came first a shelterer here, and afterwards a prisoner in the fleet. These people made an addition to these laws, which had formerly been established in such illegal sanctuaries, for they provided large books in which they entered the names of persons 
who entered into their association, swearing to defend one another against all bailiffs and such like. In consequence of which, they very often rescued prisoners out of custody, or even entered the houses of officers for that purpose. Amongst the number of these unhappy people, who, by protecting themselves against the lesser judgments of the law, involved themselves in greater difficulties, and at last drew on the greatest and most heavy sentence which it could pronounce, was him we now speak of. Charles Towers was a person whose circumstances had been bad for many years, and, in order to retrieve them, he had turned gamester. For a guinea or two, it seems, he engaged for the payment of a very considerable debt for a friend, who, not paying it at his time, Towers was obliged to fly for shelter into the old mint then in being. He went into the new, which was just then setting up, and where the shelterers took upon them to act more licentiously and with greater outrages towards officers of justice than the people in any other places had done. Particularly, they erected a tribunal, on which a person chosen for that purpose sat as a judge with great state and solemnity. When any bailiff had attempted to arrest persons within the limits which they assumed for their jurisdiction, he was seized immediately by a mob of their own people, and hurried before the judge of their own choosing. There a sort of charge or indictment was preferred against him, for attempting to disturb the peace of the shelterers within the jurisdiction of the seven cities of refuge. Then they examined certain witnesses to prove this, and, thereupon pretending to convict such bailiff as a criminal, he was sentenced by their judge aforesaid to be whipped or otherwise punished as he thought fit, which was executed frequently in the most cruel and barbarous manner, by dragging him through ditches and other nasty places, tearing his clothes off his back, and even endangering his life. One West, who had got amongst them, being arrested by John Errington, who carried him to his house by Wapping Wall, the shelterers in the new mint no sooner heard thereof, but assembling on a Sunday morning in a great number, with guns, swords, staves, and other offensive weapons, they went to the house of the said John Errington, and there, terrifying and affrighting the persons in the house, rescued John West, pursuant, as they said, to their oaths, he being registered as a protected person in their books of the seven cities of refuge. In this expedition, Charles Towers was very forward, being dressed with only a blue pea-jacket, without hat, wig, or shirt, with a large stick like a quarter-staff in his hand, his face and breast being so blackened that it appeared to be done with soot and grease, contrary to the statute made against those called the Waltham Blacks, and done after the first day of June, 1723, when that statute took place. Upon an indictment for this, the fact being very fully and dearly proved, notwithstanding his defense, which was that he was no more disguised than his necessity obliged him to be, not having wherewith to provide himself clothes, and his face perhaps dirty and daubed with mud, the jury found him guilty, and he thereupon received sentence of death. Before the execution of that sentence, he insisted strenuously on his innocence as to the point on which he was found guilty and condemned, that is, having his face blacked and disguised within the intent and meaning of the statute, but he readily acknowledged that he had been often present, and assisted at such mock courts of justice as were held in the new mint, though he absolutely denied sitting as judge when one Mr. Westwood, a bailiff, was most abominably abused by an order of that pretended court. He seemed fully sensible of the ills and injuries he had committed by being concerned amongst such people, but often said, that he thought the bailiffs had sufficiently revenged themselves by the cruel treatment they had used the riotous persons with, when they fell within their power, 
particularly since they hacked and chopped a carpenter's right arm in such a manner that it was obliged to be cut off, had abused others in so terrible a degree that they were not able to work or do anything for their living. He himself had received several large cuts over the head, which, though received six weeks before, yet were in a very bad condition at the time of his death. As to disguises, he constantly averred they were never practiced in the new mint. He owned they had had some masquerades amongst them, to which himself, amongst others, had gone in the dress of a miller, and his face all covered with white. But as to any blacking, or other means to prevent his face being known when he rescued West, he had none, but, on the contrary, was in his usual habit, as all the rest were that accompanied him. He framed as well as he could a petition for mercy, setting forth the circumstances of the thing, and the hardship he conceived it to be to suffer upon the bare construction of an act of Parliament. He set forth likewise the miserable condition of his wife and two children already, she being also big of a third. This petition she presented to his majesty at the council chamber door, but the necessity there was of preventing such combinations for obstructing justice rendered it of no effect. Upon her return, and Towers being acquainted with the result, he said he was contented, that he went willingly into a land of quiet from a world so troublesome and so tormenting as this had been to him. Then he kneeled down and prayed with great fervency and devotion, after which he appeared very composed, and showed no rage against the prosecutor and witnesses who had brought on his death, as is too often the case with men in his miserable condition. On the day appointed for his execution, he was carried in a cart to a gallows whereon he was to suffer in wapping, the crowd, as is not common on such occasions, lamenting him, and pouring down showers of tears, he himself behaving with great calmness and intrepidity. After prayers had been said, he stood up in the cart, and, turning towards the people, professed his innocence in being in a disguise at the time of rescuing Mr. West, and, with the strongest asseverations, said that it was Captain Buckland, and not himself who sat as judge upon Mr. Jones the bailiff, though, as he complained, he had been ill-used while he remained a prisoner upon that score. To this he added that for the robberies and thefts with which he was charged, they were falsities, as he was a dying man. Money, indeed, be said, might be shaken out of the breeches pocket of the bailiff when he was ditched, but that whether it was or was not so, he was no judge, for he never saw any of it. That as to any design of breaking open Sir Isaac Tilliard's house, he was innocent of that also. In fine, he owned that the judgment of God was exceeding just for the many offences he committed, but that the sentence of the law was too severe, because, as he understood it, he had done nothing culpable within the intent of the statute on which he died. After this, he inveighed for some time against bailiffs, and then, crying with vehemency to God to receive his spirit, he gave up the ghost on the 4th of January, 1724-5. However, the death of towers might prevent people committing such acts as breaking open the houses of bailiffs and setting prisoners at liberty, yet it did not quite stifle or destroy those attempts which necessitous people made for screening themselves from public justice insomuch that the government were obliged at last to cause a bill to be brought into Parliament for the preventing such attempts for the future, whereupon, in the eleventh year of the late king, it passed into a law to this effect. That if any number of persons not less than three associate themselves together in the hamlet of Wapping, Stepney, or in any other place within the bills of mortality, in order to shelter themselves from their debts, after complaint made thereof by presentment of a grand jury, and, 
should obstruct any officer legally empowered and authorized in the execution of any writ or warrant against any person whatsoever, and in such obstructing or hindering, should hurt, wound, or injure any person, then any offender convicted of such offense should suffer as a felon and be transported for seven years in like manner as other persons are so convicted. And it is further enacted by the same law that upon application made to the judge of any court out of which the writs therein mentioned are issued, the aforesaid judge, if he see proper, may grant a warrant directly to the sheriff or other person proper to raise the posse comitatus, where there is any probability of resistance. And if in the execution of such warrant any disturbance should happen and a rescue be made, then the persons assisting in such rescue, or who harbor or conceal the persons so rescued, shall be transported for seven years in like manner as if convicted of felony, but all indictments upon this statute are to be commenced within six months after the fact committed. End of section 62. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 63 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed Volume 1 Edited by Arthur L. Hayward Section 63 The Life of Thomas Anderson, a Scotch Thief Amongst a multitude of tragical adventures, it is with some satisfaction that I mention the life of a person who was of the number of those few which take warning in time, and having once felt the rod of affliction, fear it ever afterwards thomas anderson was the son of reputable parents in the city of aberdeen in scotland his father was of the number of those unhappy people who went over to darien when the scots made their settlement there in the reign of the late king william his son thomas being left under the care of his mother then a widow by this his education suffered and he was put apprentice to a glazier, although his father had been a man of some fashion, and the boy always educated with hopes of living genteelly. However, he is not the first that has been so deceived, though he took it so to heart that, at first going to his master, his grief was so great as had very nigh killed him. He continued, however, with his master two years, and then making bold with about nine guineas of his and thirteen of his mother's he procured a horse and made the greatest speed he could to edinburgh tom was sensible enough that he should be pursued and hearing of a ship ready to sail from Leith for london he went on board it and in five days time having a fair wind they arrived in the river of thames as soon as he got on shore Tom had the precaution to take lodging in a little street near Burr Street in Wapping. There he put his things, and his stock now being dwindled to twelve guineas, he put two of them in his fob with his mother's old gold watch, which he had likewise brought along with him, and then went out to see the town. He had not walked far in Fleet Street, whither he had conveyed himself by boat, but he was saluted by a well-dressed woman, in a tone almost as broad as his own. Conscious of what he had committed, he thought it was somebody that knew him and would have taken him up. He turned thereupon pale and started. The woman, observing his surprise, said, "'Sir, I beg your pardon. I took you for one Mr. Johnson, of Hull, my near relation.' but I see you are not the same gentleman, though you are very like him. Anderson, thereupon taking heart, walked a little way with her, 
and the woman inviting him to drink tea at her lodgings, he accepted it readily, and away they went together to the bottom of Salisbury Court, where the woman lived. After tea was over, so many overtures were made that our newcome spark was easily drawn into an amour, and after a considerable time spent in parley, it was at last agreed that he should pass for her husband newly come from sea, and this being agreed upon, the landlady was called up and the story told in form. The name the woman assumed was that of Johnson, and Tom consequently was obliged to go by the same. So, after compliments expressed on all sides for his safe return, a supper was provided, and about ten o'clock they went to bed together. Whether anything had been put in the drink, or whether it was only owing to the quantity he had drunk, he slept very soundly until eleven o'clock in the morning, when he was awakened by a knocking at the door. Upon getting up to open it, he was a little surprised at finding the woman gone, and more so at seeing the key thrown under the door. However, he took it up and opened it. His landlady then delivered him a letter, which, as soon as she was gone, he opened and found it to run in these terms. Dear Sir, you must know that for about three years I have been an unfortunate woman, that is, have conversed with many of your sex, as I have done with you. I need not tell you that you made me a present of what money you had about you last night, after the reckoning over the way at the George was paid. I told my landlady when I went out this morning that I was going to bring home some linen for shirts. You had best say so too, and so you may go away without noise, for as I owe her above three pound for lodging, tis odds but that as you said last night you were my husband, she will put you in trouble, and that I think would be hard, for to be sure you have paid dear enough for your frolic. I hope you will forgive this presumption, and I am yours next time you meet me. Jane Johnson Tom was not a little chagrined at this accident, especially when he found that not only the remainder of the two guineas, but also his mother's gold watch and a gold chain and ring was gone into the bargain. However, he thought it best to take the woman's word, and so, coming down and putting on the best air he could, he told his landlady he hoped his wife would bring the linen home time enough to go to breakfast, and that in the meanwhile, he would go to the coffee-house and read the news. The woman said it was very well, and Tom, getting to the waterside, directed them to row to the stairs nearest to his lodging by Burr Street, ruminating all the way he went on the accident which had befallen him. The rumors of Jonathan Wilde, then in the zenith of his glory, had somehow or other reached the ears of our North Britain. He thereupon mentioned him to the waterman, who, perceiving that he was a stranger, and hoping to get a pot of drink for the relation, obliged him with the best account they were able of Mr. Wilde and his proceedings. As soon, therefore, as Anderson came home, he put the other two guineas in his pocket, and over he came in a coach to the old bailey, where Mr. Wilde had just then set up in his office, Mr. Anderson, being introduced in form, acquainted him in good blunt scotch how he had lost his money and his watch. Jonathan used him very civilly, and promised his utmost diligence in recovering it. Tom, being willing to save money, inquired of him his way home by land on foot, and having received instructions, he set out accordingly. About the middle of Cheapside, a well-dressed gentleman came up to him. Friend, says he, I have heard you ask five or six people, as I followed you, your way to Burr Street. I am going thither, and so, if you'll walk along with me, twill save you the labor of asking further questions. Tom readily accepted the gentleman's civility, and so on they trudged, until they came within twenty yards of the place, and into Tom's knowledge. Young man, then says the stranger, since I have shown you the way home, 
you must not refuse drinking a pint with me at a tavern hard by of my acquaintance no sooner were they entered and sat down but a third person was introduced into their company as an acquaintance of the former a good supper was provided and when they had drunk about a pint of wine apiece says the gentleman who brought him thither to anderson you seem an understanding young fellow i fancy your circumstances are not of the best come if you have a tolerable head and any courage i'll put you in a way to live as easy as you can wish tom pricked up his ears upon this motion and told him that truly as to his circumstances he had guessed very right but that he wished he would be so good as to put him into any road of living like a gentleman for to say the truth sir says he it was with that view i left my own country to come up to london well spoken my lad says the other and like a gentleman thou shalt live but hark ye are you well acquainted with the men of quality's families about aberdeen yes sir says he well then replied the stranger do you know none of them who has a son about your age yes yes replied tom my lord j sent his eldest son to our college at aberdeen to be bred and he and i are much alike and not above ten days difference in our ages why then replied the spark it will do and here is to your honour's health come from this time forward you are the honourable mr j son and heir apparent to the right honourable the lord j to make the story short these sharpers equipped him like the person they put him upon the town to be and lodging him at the house of a scotch merchant who was in the secret with no less than three footmen all in proper livery to attend him in the space of ten days time they took up effect upon his credit to the amount of a thousand pounds tom was cunning enough to lay his hands on a good diamond ring two suits of clothes and a handsome watch and improved mightily from a fortnight's conversation with these gentlemen he foresaw the storm would quickly begin the news of his arrival under the name he had assumed having been in the papers a week so to prevent what might happen to himself he sends his three footmen on different errands and making up his clothes and some holland shirts into a bundle called a coach and drove off to burr street where having taken the remainder of his things that had been there ever since his coming to town he bid the fellow drive him to the house of a person near st catherine's to whom he had known his mother direct letters when in scotland yet recollecting in the coach that by this means he might be discovered by his relations he called to the coachman before he reached there and remembering an inn in holborn which he had heard spoken of by the scotch merchant where he had lodged in his last adventure bid the fellow drive thither saying he was afraid to be out late and if he made haste he would give him a shilling when he came thither and had had his two portmanteaus carried into the inn pretending to be very sick he went immediately upstairs to bed having first ordered a pint of wine to be burnt and brought upstairs reflecting in the night on the condition he was in and the consequence of the measures he was taking he resolved with himself to abandon his ill courses at once and try to live honestly in some plantation of the west indies these meditations kept him pretty much awake so that it was late in the morning before he arose having ordered coffee for his breakfast he gave the chamberlain a shilling to go and fetch the newspapers where the first thing he saw was an account of his own cheat in the body of the paper and at the end of it an advertisement with a reward for apprehending him this made him very uneasy and the rather because he had no clothes but those which he had taken up as aforesaid so he ordered the chamberlain to send for a tailor and pretended to be so much indisposed that he could not get out when the tailor came he directed him to make him a riding-suit with all the expedition he could 
the tailor promised it in two days time the next day pretending to be still worse he sent the chamberlain to take a place for him in the bristol coach which being done he removed himself and his things early in the morning to the inn where it lay and set out the next day undiscovered for bristol three days after his arrival he met with a captain bound for the west indies with whom having agreed for a passage he set sail for jamaica but a fresh gale at sea accidentally damaging their rudder they were obliged to come to an anchor in cork where the captain himself and several other passengers went on shore anderson accompanied him to the coffee-house where calling for the papers that last came in he had liked to have swooned at the table on finding himself to have been discovered at bristol and to have sailed in such a ship the day before the persons came down to apprehend him in order to his being carried back to london as soon as he came a little to himself he stepped up to the man of the house and asked him for the vault privy which being shown him he immediately threw the paper down and as soon as he came out finding the captain ready to go he accompanied him with great satisfaction on board again where things being set to rights by the next day at ten o'clock they sailed with a fair wind and without any further cross accident arrived safe at jamaica there tom had the good luck to pick up a woman with a tolerable fortune and about three years later remitted three hundred pounds home to the jeweller who had been defrauded of the watch and the ring and directed him to pay what was over after deducting his own debt to the people who had trusted him with other things and who upon his going off had recovered most of them and were by this means made a tolerable satisfaction he resided in the west indies for about five years in all and in that time by his own industry acquired a very handsome fortune of his own and therewith returned to scotland i should be very glad if this story would incline some people who have got money in not such honest ways though perhaps less dangerous to endeavour at extenuating the crimes they have been guilty of by making such reparation as in their power by which at once they atone for their fault and regain their lost reputation but i am afraid this advice may prove both unsuccessful and unseasonable and therefore shall proceed in my narrations as the course of these memoirs directs me end of section sixty three recording by linda johnson Section 64 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea K lives of the most remarkable criminals who have been condemned and executed volume one edited by arthur l hayward section sixty four the life of joseph pickin a highwayman there cannot perhaps be a greater misfortune to a man than his having a woman of ill principles about him whether as a wife or otherwise when they once lay aside principles either of modesty or honesty women become commonly the most abandoned and as their sex renders them capable of seducing so their vices tempt them not often to persuade men to such crimes as otherwise perhaps they would never have thought of this was the case of the malefactor the story of whose misfortunes we are now to relate Joseph Pickin was the son of a tailor in Clerkenwell who worked hard at his employment and took pleasure in nothing but providing for and bringing up his family. This unhappy son, Joseph, was his darling, and nothing grieved him so much upon his deathbed as the fears of what might befall the boy 
being then an infant of five years old. However, his mother, though a widow, took so much care of his education that he was well enough instructed for the business she designed him, viz. that of a vintner, to which profession he was bound at a noted tavern near Billingsgate. He served his time very faithfully and with great approbation, but falling in love, or to speak more properly, taking a whim of marriage in his head, he accepted of a young woman in the neighborhood as his partner for life. Soon after this, he removed to Windsor, where he took the tap at a well-accustomed inn, and began the world in a very probable way of doing well. However, partly through his own misfortunes, and partly through the extravagance of his wife, in a little more than a twelve-month's time he found himself thirty pound in debt, and in no likelihood from his trade of getting money to pay it. This made him very melancholy, and nothing added so great a weight to his load of affliction as the uneasiness he was under at the misfortunes which might befall his wife, to whom as yet this fall in his circumstances was not known. However, fearing it would be soon discovered in another way, at last he mentioned it to her, at the same time telling her that she must retrench her expenses, for he was now so far from being able to support them that he could hardly get him family bread. Her mother and she thereupon removed to a lodging, where by the side of the bed, poor Pickin used to slumber upon the boards, heavily disconsolate with the weight of his misfortunes. One day after talking of them to his wife, he said, I am now quite at my wit's end. I have no way left to get anything to support us. What shall I do? Do? answered she. Why, what should a man do that wants money and has any courage, but go upon the highway? The poor man, not knowing how else to gain anything, even took her advice and recollecting a certain companion of his who had once upon a time offered the same expedient for relieving their joint misfortunes, Pickin thereupon found him out, and without saying it was his wife's proposal, pretended that his sorrows had at last so prevailed upon him that he was resolved to repair the injuries of fortune by taking away something from those she had used better than him. His comrade unhappily addicted himself still to his old way of thinking, and instead of dissuading him from his purpose, seemed pleased that he had taken such a resolution. He told him that for his part he always thought danger rather to be chosen than want, and that while soldiers hazarded their lives in war for sixpence a day, he thought it was cowardice to make a man starve, where he had a chance of getting so much more than those who hazarded as much as they did. Accordingly, Pickin and his companion provided themselves that week with all necessaries for their expedition, and going upon it in the beginning of the next, set out and had success, as they called it, in two or three enterprises. But returning to London in the end of the week, they were apprehended for a robbery committed on one Charles Cooper on Finchley Common, for which they were tried the next sessions and both capitally convicted. Through fear of death and want of necessaries, Joseph Pickin fell into a low and languishing state of health, under which, however, he gave all the signs of penitence and sorrow that could be expected for the crimes he had committed. Yet though he loaded his wife with the weight of all his crimes, he forbore any harsh or shocking reproaches against her, saying only that as she had brought him into all the miseries he now felt, so she had left him to bear the weight of them alone, without either ever coming near him or affording him any assistance. However, he said he was so well satisfied of the multitude of his own sins, and the need he had of forgiveness from God, that he thought it a small condition to forgive her, which he did freely from his heart. In these sentiments he took the holy sacrament, 
and continued with great calmness to wait the execution of his sentence. In the passage to execution, and even at the fatal tree, he behaved himself with amazing circumstances of quietness and resignation, and though he appeared much less fearful than any of those who died with him, yet he parted with life almost as soon as the cart was drawn away. He was about twenty-two years of age, or somewhat more, at the time he suffered, which was on the 24th of February, 1724-5, much pitied by the spectators, and much lamented by those that knew him. End of section 64. Recording by Andrea K. Section 65 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea K. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward. Section 65. The Life of Thomas Packer, a Highwayman. Thomas Packer, the companion of the last-named criminal, both in his crimes and in his punishment, was the son of very honest and reputable parents not far from Newgate Street. His father gave him a competent education, designing always to put him in a trade, and as soon as he was fit for it, placed him accordingly with a vintner at Greenwich. There he served for some years, but growing out of humor with the place, he made continual instances to his friends to be removed. They, willing and desirous to comply with the young man's honors, at length, after repeated solicitation, prevailed with his master to consent, and then he was removed to another tavern in town. There he completed his time, but ever after, being of a rambling disposition, was continually changing places and never settled. Amongst those in which he had lived, there was a tavern where he resided as a drawer for about six weeks. Here he got into acquaintance of a woman, handsome, indeed, but of no fortune and little reputation. His affection for this woman and the money he spent on her was the chief occasion of those wants which prevailed upon him to join with Pickin in those attempts which were fatal to them both. It cannot, indeed, be said that the woman in any degree excited him to such practices, on the contrary, the poor creature really endeavored by every method she could to procure money for their support, and did all that in her lay, while Packer was under his misfortunes, to prevent the necessities of life from hindering him in that just care which was necessary to secure his interest in that which was to come. Packer was in himself a lad of very great good nature and not without just principles if he had been well improved. But the rambling life he had led, and his too tender affection for the before-mentioned woman, led him into great crimes rather than he would see her sustain great wants. The reflection which he conceived his death would bring upon his parents, and the miseries which he dreaded it would draw upon his wife and child, seemed to press him heavier than any apprehension for himself to his own sufferings, which from the time of his commitment he bore with the greatest patience and improved to the utmost of his power. As he was sensible there was no hopes of remaining in this world, so he immediately removed his thought, his wishes, and his hopes from thence, applied himself seriously to his devotions, and never suffered even the woman whom he so much loved to interfere or hinder them in any degree. As it had been his first week of robbing, and his last, too, he had little confession to make in that respect. He acknowledged, however, the fact which they had done in that space, 
and seemed to be heartily penitent, ashamed, and sorry for his offenses. At the place of execution he behaved with the same decency which accompanied him through all the sorrowful stations of his sad condition. He was asked whether he would say anything to the people, but he declined it, though he had a paper in his hand which he had designed to read, which for the satisfaction of the public I have thought fit to annex. The paper left by Thomas Packer. Good people, I see a large number of you assembled here to behold a miserable end of us whom the law condemns to death for our offense, and for the sake of giving you warning, makes us in our last moments public spectacles. I submit with the utmost resignation to the stroke of the law, and I heartily pray, Almighty God, that the sight of my shameful death may inspire every one of you with lasting resolutions of leading an honest life. The facts for which both Pickin and I die were really committed by us, and consequently the sentence under which we suffer is very just. Let me then press ye again that the warnings of our deaths may not be in vain, but that you will remember our fate, and by urging that against your depraved wishes, prevent following our steps. Which is all I have to say. Thomas Packer He was about twenty years of age at the time he suffered, which was with the aforementioned malefactor at Tyburn, much pitied by all the spectators. End of section 65. Recording by Andrea K. Section 66 of the Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman The Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1 Edited by Arthur L. Hayward, Section 66, The Life of Thomas Bradley, a Street Robber one must want humanity and be totally void of that tenderness which dominates both a man and a christian if we feel not some pity for those who are brought to a violent and shameful death from a sudden and rash act excited either by necessity or through the frailty of human nature sinking under misfortune or hurried into mischief by some sudden transport of passion I am persuaded, therefore, that the greater part, if not all, of my readers will feel the same emotions of tenderness and compassion for the miserable youth of whom I am now going to speak. Thomas Bradley was the son of an officer in the Customs House at Liverpool. The father took care of his education, and having qualified him for a seafaring business in reading and writing, placed him therein. He came up accordingly with the master of a vessel to London, where some misfortunes befalling the said master, Thomas was turned out of his employment and left to shift for himself. Want pinched him. He had no friends, nor anybody to whom he might apply for relief. And in the anguish with which his suffering oppressed him, he unfortunately resolved to steal, rather than submit to starving or to begging. One fact he committed, but could never be prevailed on to mention the time, the person, or the place. The robbery for which he was condemned was upon a woman carrying home another woman's riding hood, which she had borrowed, and he, assaulting her on the highway, took it from her, which was valued at twenty-five shillings. Upon this he was capitally convicted at the next sessions of the Old Bailey, nor could never be prevailed on by a person to apply for a pardon. On the contrary, he said it was his greatest grief that notwithstanding all he could do to stifle it, the news would reach his father and break his heart. 
he was told that such thoughts were better omitted than suffering to disturb him when he was on the point of going to another and if he repented thoroughly to a better life at which he sighed and said their reasoning was very right and he would comply with it if he could from that time he appeared more composed and cheerful and resigned to his fate this temper he persevered to the time of his execution and died with as much courage and penitence as is ever seen on any of those unhappy persons who suffer at the same place at the time of his death he was not quite nineteen years of age he died between the last mentioned malefactor and he whose life we are next to relate end of section sixty six Section 67 of the Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman lives of the most remarkable criminals who have been condemned and executed volume one edited by arthur l hayward section sixty seven the life of william lipsat a thief william lipsat was the son of a person at dublin in very tolerable circumstances which he strained to the utmost to give this lad a tolerable education when he had acquired this he sent him over to an uncle of his in stockton in worcestershire where he lived with more indulgence than ever when at home his uncle having no children and behaving to him with all the tenderness of a parent however on some little difference the boy having long had an inclination to see this great city of london he took that occasion to go away from his uncle and accordingly came down to town and was employed in the service of one mr kelway he had not been long there before he received a letter from his father entreating him to return to dublin with all the speed he was able the letter was soon followed by another which not only desired but commanded him to come back to ireland he was not troubled at thinking of the voyage and going home to his friends but he was very desirous of carrying money over with him to make a figure amongst his relations which not knowing how to get he at last bethought himself of stealing it from a place where he knew it lay after several struggles with himself vanity prevailed and he accordingly went and took away the things viz fifty-seven guineas and a half twenty-five caroluses five jacobuses three moidoras six piece of silver two purses valued at twelve pence these as he said would make his journey pleasant and his reception welcome which was the reason he took them the evidence was very dear and direct against him so that the jury found him guilty without hesitation from the day of his condemnation to the day he died he neither affected to extenuate his crime nor reflect as some are apt to do on the cruelty of the prosecutors witnesses or the court that condemned him so far from it that he always acknowledged the justice of his sentence seemed grieved only for the greatness of his sin and the affliction of the punishment of it would bring upon his relations who had hitherto always borne the best of characters though by his failing they were now like to be stigmatized with the most infamous crimes however since his grief came now too late he resolved as much as he was able to keep such thoughts out of his head and apply himself to what more nearly concerned him and for which all the little time he had was rather too short in a word in his condition none behaved with more gravity or to the outward appearance with more penitence than this criminal did he suffered with the same resignation which had appeared in everything he did from the time of his condemnation 
on the first of february seventeen twenty four five with the before mentioned malefactors being then scarce eighteen years of age carolus was a gold coin of charles i worth twenty to twenty three shillings a jacobus coined by james i was of the same value the moidor was worth about twenty seven shillings End of section 67section 68 of lives of the most remarkable criminals who have been condemned and executed for murder the highway housebreaking street robberies coining or other offenses volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org lives of the most remarkable criminals who have been condemned and executed Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward, Section 68. The Life of John Hewlett, a Murderer. There are several facts which have happened in the world, the circumstances attending which, if we compare them as they are related by one or other, we can hardly fix in our own mind any certainty of belief concerning them. Such an equality is there in the weight of evidence of one side and of the other such at the time it happened was the case of the malefactor before us john hewlett was born in warwickshire the son of richard hewlett a butcher and though not bred up with his father he was yet bred to the same employment at leicester from which malicious people said he acquired a bloody and barbarous disposition however he did not serve his time out with his master but being a strong, sturdy young fellow, and hoping some extraordinary preferment in the army, with that view he engaged himself in the first regiment of the guards during the reign of the late King William. In the war he gained the reputation of a very brave, but a very cruel and very rough fellow, and therefore was relied on by his officers, yet never liked by them. Persons of a similar disposition generally live on good terms with one another, Hewlett found out a corporal, one blunt, much of the same humor with himself, never pleased when in safety, nor afraid though in the midst of danger. At the siege of Namur in Flanders, these fellows happened to be both in the trenches when the French made a desperate sally and were beaten off at last with much loss and in such confusion that their pursuers lodged themselves in one of the outworks and had liked to have gained another, in the attack on which a young cadet of the regiment in which Blunt served was killed. Blunt, observing it, went to the commanding officer and told him that the cadet had nineteen pistoles in his pocket, and it was a shame the French should have them. Why, that's true, corporal, said the colonel, but I don't see at present how we can help it. No, replied Blunt, give me but leave to go and search his pockets, and I'll answer for bringing the money back. Why, fool, said the colonel, Dost thou not see the place covered with French? Should a man stir from hence, they would pour a whole shower of small shot upon him. I'll venture that, says Blunt. But how will you know the body, added the colonel? I am afraid we have left a score besides him behind us. Why, look ye, sir, said the corporal. Let me have no more objections, and I'll answer that. He was clapped, good colonel, do you see? And that to some purpose, so that if I can't know him by his face... I may know him by somewhat else. Well, said the colonel, if you have a mind to be knocked on the head and take it ill to be denied, you must go, I think. On which Blunt, waiting for no further orders, marched directly in the midst of the enemy's fire to the dead bodies, which lay within ten yards of the muzzle of their pieces, and turning over several of the dead bodies, he distinguished that of the cadet and brought away the prize for which he had so fairly ventured. This action put Hewlett on his mettle. He resolved to do something that might equal it, and an opportunity offered some time after of performing such a service as no man in the army would have undertaken. It happened thus. The engineer who was to set fire to the train of a mine which had been made under a bastion of the enemies happened to have drank very hard overnight and mistaking the hour, laid the match an hour sooner than he ought. A sentinel immediately came out, called out aloud, What? 
Have you clapped fire to the train? There's 20 people in the mine who will be all blown up. It should not have been fired till 12 o'clock. On hearing this, Hewlett ran in with his sword drawn and therewith cut off the train the moment before it would have given fire to all the barrels of powder that were within, by which he saved the lives of all the pioneers who were carrying the mines still forward at the time the wild fire was unseasonably lighted by the engineer. At the Battle of Landau, he had his skull broken open by a blow from the butt end of a musket. This occasioned his going through the operation called trepanning, which is performed by an engine like a coffee mill, which being fixed on the bruised part of the bone is turned round and cuts out all the black till the edges appear white and sound. After this cure had been performed upon him, he never had his senses in the same manner as he had before, but upon the least drinking fell into a passion which was but very little removed from madness. He returned into England after the peace of Ryswick, and being taken into a gentleman's service, he there married a wife by whom he had nine children. Happy was it for them that they were all dead before his disastrous end. How Hewlett came to be employed as a watchman a little before his death, the papers I have give me no account of, only that he was in that station at the time of the death of Joseph Candy, for whose murder he was indicted for giving him a mortal bruise on the head with his staff. On the 26th of December, 1724, upon full evidences of eyewitnesses, the jury found him guilty, he making no other defense than great asservations of his innocence and an obstinate denial of the fact. After his conviction, being visited in the condemned hold, instead of showing any marks of penitence or contrition, he raved against the witnesses who had been produced to destroy him, called them all perjured, and prayed God to inflict some dreadful judgment on them. Nay, he went so far as to desire that he ought himself have the executing thereof, wishing that after his death his apparition might come and terrify them to their graves. When it was represented to him how odd this behavior was, and how far distant from that calmness and tranquility of mind with which it became him to clothe himself before he went into the presence of his maker, these representations had no effect. He still continued to rave against his accusers and against the witnesses who had sworn at his trial. As death grew nearer, he appeared not a bit terrified, nor seemed uneasy at all at leaving this life, only at leaving his wife, and as he phrased it, some old acquaintance in Warwickshire. However, he desired to receive the sacrament, and said he would prepare himself for it as well as he could. He went to the place of execution in the same manner in which he had passed the days of his confinement till that time. At Tyburn, he was not satisfied with protesting his innocence to the people, but designing to have one of the prayer books, which was made use of in the cart, he kissed it as people do when they take oath, and then again turning to the mob, declared as he was a dying man, he never gave Candy a blow in his life. Thus, with many ejaculations, he gave way to fate in an advanced age at Tyburn, at the same time with the malefactors last mentioned. End of section 68「Section 69 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Miles. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward, Section 69, The Lives of James Camel and William Marshall, Thieves and Footpads. The Lives of James Camel and William Marshall, Thieves and Footpads. 
James Camel was born of parents in very low circumstances, and the misfortunes arising therefrom were much increased by his father dying while he was an infant, and leaving him to the care of a widow in the lowest circumstances of life. The consequence was what might be easily foreseen, for he forgot what little he had learned in his youngest days, loitering away his time about Islington, Hoxton, Moorfield, and such places, being continually drinking there and playing at cudgels, skittles, and such like. He never applied himself to labor or honest working for his bread, but either got it from his mother or a few other friends, or by methods of a more scandalous nature, I mean pilfering and stealing from others, for which, after he had long practiced it, he came at last to an untimely death. He was a fellow of a froward disposition, hasty and yet revengeful, and made up of almost all the vices that go to forming a debauchee in low life. He had had a long acquaintance with the person that suffered with him for their offenses, but what made him appear in the worst light was that he had endeavored to commit acts of cruelty at the time he did the robbery. Notwithstanding, he insisted not only that he was innocent of the latter part of the offense, but that he never committed the robbery at all, though Marshall, his associate, did not deny it. They had been together in these exploits for some time, and once, particularly, coming from Sadler's Wells, they took from a gentlewoman a basket full of bedchild linen to a very great value, which, offering to sell to a woman in Monmouth Street, she privately sent for a constable to apprehend them. One of their companions who went with them, observing this, he tipped them the wink to be gone, which the old woman of the house, perceiving, caught hold of Marshall by the coat, and while they struggled, the third man whipped off a gold watch, a silver collar and bells, and a silver plate for holding snuffers, and pretending to interpose in the quarrel, slipped through them and out at the door, as Camel and Marshall did immediately after him. Once upon a time it happened that Marshall had no money, and his credit being at a par and a warrant out to take him for a great debt, and another to take him for a picking of pockets, he was in a great quandary how to escape both. He strolled into St. James's Park, and walking there pretty late behind the trees, a woman came up to the seat directly before him when she fell to roaring and crying. Marshall, being unseen, clapped himself down behind the seat and listened with great attention. He perceived the woman had her pocket in her hand and heard her distinctly say that a rogue not to be contented with cutting one pocket and taking it away, but he must cut the other and let it drop at her foot. Then she wiped her eyes and, laying down her pocket by her, began to shake her petticoats to see if the other pocket had not lodged between them as the former had done. So Marshall took the opportunity and secretly conveyed that away, thinking one lamentation might serve for both. Upon turning the pocket out, he found only a thread paper, a housewife, and a crown piece. Upon this crown piece, he lived a fortnight at a milk house, coming twice a day for milk and hiding himself at nights in some of the grass plots, it being summer. But his creditor dying, and the person whose pocket he had picked going to Denmark, he came abroad again, and soon after engaged with Camel in the fact for which they were both hanged. It was committed upon a man and a woman coming through the fields from Islington, and the things they took did not amount to above thirty shillings. After they were convicted and had received sentence of death, Camel sent for the practice of piety, the whole duty of man, and such other good books as he thought might assist him in the performance of their duty. Yet, notwithstanding all the outward appearance of resignation to the divine will, the Sunday before his execution, upon the coming into the chapel of a person whom he took to be his prosecutor, he flew into a very great passion and expressed his uneasiness that he had no instrument there to murder him with. And notwithstanding all that could be said to him to abate his passion, he continued restless and uneasy until the person was obliged to withdraw, and then with great great attention, applied himself to hear the prayers and discourse that was made proper for that occasion. 
Marshall, in the meanwhile, continued very sick, but though he could not attend the chapel, did all that could be expected from a true penitent. In this condition they both continued until the time of their death, when Marshall truly acknowledged the fact, but Camel prevaricated about it, and at last peremptorily denied it. They suffered on the 30th of April, 1725. Camel, appearing with an extraordinary carelessness and unconcern, desired them to put him out of the world quickly, and was very angry that they did not do it in less time. End of section 69. Section 70 of The Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon lives of the most remarkable criminals who have been condemned and executed volume one edited by arthur l hayward section seventy the life of john guy a deer stealer one would have thought that the numerous executions which had happened upon the appearance of those called the waltham blacks and the severity of that act of parliament which their folly had occasioned would effectually have prevented any outrages for the future upon either the forests belonging to the crown or the parks of private gentlemen but it seems there were still fools capable of undertaking such mad exploits it is said that guy being at a public house with a young woman whom as the country people phrase it was his sweetheart a discourse arose at supper concerning the expeditions of the deer stealers which guy's mistress took occasion to express great admiration of and to regard them as so many heroes who had behaved with courage enough to win the most obdurate heart adding that she was very fond of venison and she wished she had known some of them this silly accident proved fatal to the poor fellow who engaging with one biddesford an old deer stealer they broke into such forests and parks and carried off abundance of deer with impunity but the keepers at last getting a number of stout young fellows to their assistance waylaid them one night when they were informed by the keeper of an alehouse that guy and biddesford intended to come for deer I must inform my reader that the method these young men took in deer stealing was this they went into the park on foot sometimes with a crossbow and sometimes with a couple of dogs being armed always however with pistols for their own defense when they had killed a buck they trussed him up and put him upon their backs and so walked off neither of them being able to procure horses for such service on the night that the keepers were acquainted with their coming they sent to a neighboring gentleman for the assistance of two of his grooms the fellows came about eleven o'clock at night and tying their horses in a little copse went to the place where the keepers had appointed to keep guard this was on a little rising ground planted with a star grove through the avenues of which they could see all round them without being discerned themselves no sooner therefore had guy and his companion passed into the forest but suffering them to pass by one of the entries of the grove where they were they immediately issued out upon them and pursued them so closely that they were within a few yards of them when they entered the coppice where the two grooms had left their horses they did not stay so much as to untie them but cutting the bridles mounted them and rode off as hard as they could turning them loose as soon as they were in safety and got home secure because the keepers could not say that they had done anything but walk across the forest this escape of theirs and some others of the same nature made them so bold that not contented with the deer and chases and such places they broke into the paddock of anthony duncombe esq and there killed certain fallow deer one charles george who was the keeper and some of his assistants hearing the noise they made 
issued out and a sharp fight beginning the deer stealers at last began to fly but a blunderbuss being fired after them two of the balls ripped the belly of biddesford who died on the spot and soon after the keepers coming up john guy was taken and being tried for this offence at the ensuing sessions of the old bailey he was convicted and received sentence of death though it was some days after before he could be persuaded that he should really suffer when he found himself included in the death warrant he applied himself heartily to prayer and other religious duties seeming to be thoroughly penitent for the crimes he had committed and with great earnestness endeavoured to make amends for his follies by sending the most tender letters to his companions who had been guilty of the same faults to induce them to forsake such undertakings which would surely bring them to the same fate which he suffered for so inconsiderable a thing perhaps as a haunch of venison whether these epistles had the effect for which they were designed i am not able to say but the papers i have by me inform me that the prisoner guy died with very cheerful resolution not above twenty-five years of age the same day with the malefactors before mentioned end of section seventy recording by john brandon section seventy one of lives of the most remarkable criminals who have been condemned and executed for murder the highway housebreaking street robberies horning or other offences volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by john brandon lives of the most remarkable criminals who have been condemned and executed volume one edited by arthur l hayward section seventy one the life of vincent davis a murderer it is an observation made by some foreigners and i'm sorry to say there's too much truth in it that though the english are perhaps less jealous than any nation under the heavens yet more men murder their wives amongst us than in any other nation in europe vincent davis was a man of no substance and who for several years together had lived in a very ill correspondence with his wife often beating and abusing her until the neighbors cried out shame but instead of amending he addicted himself still more and more to such villainous acts conversing also with other women and at last buying a knife he had the impudence to say that the knife should end her in which he was as good as his word for on a sudden quarrel he stabbed her to the heart for this murder he was indicted and also on the statute of stabbing when one thrust or stabs another not then having a weapon drawn or who hath not then first stricken the party stabbing so that he dies thereof within six months after the offender shall not have the benefit of clergy though he did it not of malice aforethought blackstone of both of which on the fullest proof he was found guilty when davis was first committed he thought fit to appear very melancholy and dejected but when he found there was no hopes of life he threw off all decency in his behaviour and to pass for a man of courage showed as much vehemence of temper as a madman would have done rattling and raving to every one that came in saying it was no crime to kill a wife and in all other expressions he made use of behaved himself like a fool or a man who has lost his wits than a man who had lived so long incredibly in a neighbourhood as he had done excepting in relation to his wife but he was induced with the hopes of passing for a bold and daring fellow to carry on this scene as long as he could 
but when the death warrant arrived all his intrepidity left him he trembled and shook and never afterwards recovered his spirits to the time of his death the account he gave of the reason of his killing his wife in so barbarous a manner was this that a tailor's servant having kept him out pretty late one night and he coming home elevated with liquor abused her upon which she got a warrant for him and sent him to new prison after this the prisoner said he could never endure her she was poisoned to his sight and the abhorrence he had for her was so great and so strong that he could not treat her with the civility which is due to every indifferent person much less with that regard which christianity requires of us towards all who are of the same religion so that upon every occasion he was ready to fly out into the greatest passions which he vented by throwing everything at her that came in his way by which means the knife was darted into her bosom with which he was slain notwithstanding the barbarity which seemed natural to this unhappy man the cruelty with which he treated his wife in her last moments the spleen and malice with which he always spoke of her and the little regret he showed for having imbued his hands in her blood but yet he had an unaccountable tenderness for his own person and employed the last days of his confinement in writing many letters to his friends and treating them to be present at his execution in order to preserve his body from the hands of the surgeons which of all things he dreaded and in order to avoid being anatomized he affronted the court at the old bailey at the time he received sentence of death intending as he said to provoke them to hang him in chains by which means he should escape the mangling of the surgeon's knives which to him seemed ten thousand times worse than death itself thus confused he passed the last moments of his life and with much ado recollected himself so as to suffer with some kind of decency which he did on the thirtieth of april at the same time with the last mentioned malefactor End of section seventy one recording by John Brandon. Section seventy two of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offences, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward. Section 72. The Life of Mary Hansen, a Murderer. Amongst the many frailties to which our nature is subject, there is not perhaps a more dangerous one than the indulging ourselves in ridiculous and provoking discourses merely to try the tempers of other people i speak not this with regard to the criminal of whom we are next to treat but of the person who in the midst of his sins drew upon himself a sudden and violent death by using such silly kind of speeches towards a woman weak in her nature and deprived of what little reason she had by drink this poor creature flying into an excess of passion with francis peters who was some distant relation to her by marriage she wounded him suddenly under the right pap with a knife before she could be prevented by any of the company of which wound he died the warm expression she had been guilty of before the blow prevailed with the jury to think she had a premeditated malice and thereupon they found her guilty fear of death want of necessaries and a natural tenderness of body brought on her soon after conviction so great a sickness that she could not attend the duties of public devotion and reduced her to the necessity of catching the little intervals of ease which her distemper allowed her to beg pardon of god for that terrible crime for which she had been guilty 
There was at the same time one Mary Stevens in the condemned hold, though she afterwards received a reprieve, who was very instrumental in bringing this poor creature to a true sense of herself and of her sins. She then confessed the murder with all its circumstances, reproached herself with having been guilty of such a crime as to murder the person who had so carefully took her under his roof, allowed her a subsistence, and been so peculiarly civil to her, for which he expected no return but what was easily in her power to make. This Mary Stevens was a weak-brained woman, full of scruples and difficulties, and almost distracted at the thoughts of having committed several robberies. After receiving the sacrament, she not only persuaded this Mary Hanson to behave herself as became a woman under her unhappy condition, but also persuaded two or three other female criminals in that place to make the best use of that mercy which the leniency of the government has extended them. There was a man suffered to go twice a day to read to them, and probably it was he who drew up the paper for Mary Hanson, which she left behind her, for though it be very agreeable to the nature of her case, yet it is penned in the manner not likely to come from the hands of a poor, ignorant woman. Certain it is, however, that she behaved herself with great calmness and resolution at the time of her death, and did not appear at all disturbed at that hurry, which, as I shall mention in the next life, happened at the place of execution. The paper she left ran in these words, that is, Though the poverty of my parents hindered me from having any great education, yet I resolved to do as I know others in my unhappy circumstances have done, and by informing the world of the causes which led me to that crime for which I so justly suffer, that by shunning it they may avoid such a shameful end, and I particularly desire all women to take heed how they give way to drunkenness, which is a vice but too common in this age. It was that disorder in which my spirits were, occasioned by the liquor I had drunk, which hurried me to the committing of a crime, at the thoughts of which, on any other time, my blood would have curdled. I hope you will afford me your prayers for my departing soul, as I offer up mine to God, that none of you may follow me to this fatal place. Having delivered this paper, she suffered at about thirty years old. End of section 72 Section 73 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, The Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward. The Life of Brian Smith, a Threatening Letter Writer. I have already observed how the Black Act was extended for punishing Charles Towers, concerned in setting up the new mint, who, as he affirmed, died only for having his face accidentally dirty at the time he assaulted the bailiff's house. I must now put you in mind of another clause in the same act, viz., that, for punishing with death, those who sent any threatening letters in order to affright persons into a compliance with their demands, for fear of being murdered themselves, or having their houses fired about their ears. This clause of the act is general, and therefore did not extend only to offenses of this kind when committed by deer-stealers and those gangs against whom it was particularly leveled at that time but included also whoever should be guilty of writing such letters to any person or persons whatsoever, which was a just and necessary construction of the act, and not only made use of in the case of this criminal, but of many more since, becoming particularly useful of late years when this practice became frequent. Brian Smith, who occasions this observation, was an Irishman of parts so very mean as perhaps were never met with in one who passed for a rational creature. Yet this fellow, forsooth, took it into his head that he might be able to frighten Baron Swaffo, a very rich Jew in the city, out of a considerable sum of money by terrifying him with a letter. For this purpose he wrote one, indeed, in a style I dare say was never seen before or since. Its spelling was a la mode de brogue, and the whole substance of the thing was filled with oaths, curses, execrations, and threatenings of murder and burning, 
if such a sum was not sent as he, in his great wisdom, thought it fit to demand. The man's management in sending this and directing how he would have an answer was of a piece with his style, and altogether made the discovery no difficult matter, so that Brian, being apprehended, was at the next sessions at the Old Bailey, tried and convicted on the evidence of some of his countrymen, and when, after receiving sentence, there remained no hopes for him of favor, to make up a consistent character, he declared himself a papist and, as is usual with persons of that profession, was forbidden by his priest to go any more to the public chapel. However, to do him justice, as far as outward circumstances will give us leave to judge, he appeared very sorry for the crime he had committed, and having had the priest with him a considerable time the day before his death, he would needs go to the place of execution in a shroud. As he went along, he repeated the Hail Mary and Paternoster. But there being many persons to suffer, and the executioner thereby being put into a confusion, Smith, observing the hurry, slipped the rope over his head, and jumped at once over the corpses in the cart amongst the mob. Had he been wise enough to have come in his clothes and not in a shroud, it is highly probable he had made his escape. But his white dress rendering him conspicuous even at a distance, the sheriff's officers were not long before they retook him and placed him in his former situation again. Hope and fear, desire of life, and dread of immediate execution had occasioned so great an emotion of his spirits that he appeared in his last moments in a confusion not to be described, and departed the world in such an agony that he was a long time before he died, which was at the same time with the malefactor before mentioned, viz. on the 30th of April, 1725. End of section 73. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 74 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward. The Life of Joseph Ward, a Footpad There are some persons who are unhappy, even from their cradles, and though every man is said to be born to a mixture of good and evil fortune, yet these seem to reap nothing from their birth but an entry into woe and a passage to misery. This unhappy man we are now speaking of, Joseph Ward, is a strong instance of this, for being the son of traveling people, he scarce knew either the persons to whom he owed his birth, or the place where he was born. However, they found a way to instruct him well enough to read, and that so well that it was afterwards of great use to him, in the most miserable state of his life. He rambled about with his father and mother until the age of fourteen. When they dying, he was left to the wide world with nothing to provide for himself but his wits so that he was almost under necessity of going into a gang of gypsies that passed by that part of the country where he was. These gypsies taught him all the arts of their living, and it happened that the crew he got into were not of the worst sort either, for they maintained themselves, rather by the credulity of country folks, than by the ordinary practices of those sort of people, stealing of poultry and robbing hedges of what linen people are careless enough to leave there. I shall have another and more proper occasion to give my readers the history of this sort of people, who were anciently formidable enough to deserve an especial act of Parliament, altered and amended in several reigns, for banishing them from the kingdom. Footnote. This was the statute of 1530, 22 Henry VIII, C. 10, directed against, quote, outlandish people calling themselves Egyptians, unquote. It was amended 1 and 2 Philip and Mary, C. 4, and 5 Elizabeth, C. 10, and sundry other legislation was of a similar tenor. End of footnote. But to go on with the story of Ward. Disliking this employment, he took occasion, when they came into Buckinghamshire, to leave them at a common by Gerard's Cross and come up to London. When he came up here, he was still in the same state, not knowing what to do to get bread. At last he bethought himself of the sea, and prevailed on a captain to take with him a pretty long voyage. He behaved himself so well in his passage that his master took him with him again, and used him very kindly. But he dying, Ward was again put to his shifts, though on his arrival in England he brought with him near thirty guineas to London. 
He took up lodgings near the Iron Gate at St. Catherine's, and taking a walk one evening on Tower Wharf, he there met with a young woman, who after much shyness suffered him to talk to her. They met there a second and a third time. She said she was niece to a pewterer of considerable circumstances not far from Tower Hill, who had promised and was able to give her five hundred pounds, but the fear of disobliging him by marriage hindered her from thinking of becoming a wife without his approbation of her spouse. These difficulties made poor Ward imagine that if he could once persuade the woman to marriage, he should soon mollify the heart of her relation, and so become happy at once. With a great deal to do, Madame was prevailed upon to consent, and going to the fleet they were married, and soon returned to St. Catherine's, to new lodgings which Ward had taken, where he proposed to continue a day or two and then wait upon the uncle. Never man was in his own opinion more happy than Joseph Ward and his new wife, but alas, all human happiness is fleeting and uncertain, especially when it depends in any degree upon a woman. The very next morning after their wedding, Madame prevailed on him to slip on an old coat and take a walk by the house which she had shown him for her uncle's. He was no sooner out of doors, but she gave the sign to some of her accomplices, who, in a quarter of an hour's time, helped her to strip the lodgings, not only of all which belonged to Ward, but of some things of value that belonged to the people of the house. They were scarce out of doors before Ward returned, who, finding his wife gone and the room stripped, set up such an outcry as alarmed all the people in the house. Instead of being concerned at Joseph's loss, they clamored at their own, and told him in so many words that if he did not find the woman, or make them reparation for their goods, they would send him to Newgate. But alas, it was neither in Ward's power to do one nor the other. Upon which the people were as good as their word, for they sent for a constable and had him before a justice. There, the whole act appearing, the judge discharged him, and told them they must take up their remedy against him at the common law. Upon this, Ward took the advantage and made off, but taking to drinking to drive away the sorrows that encompassed him, he at last fell into ill company, and by them was prevailed on to join in doing evil actions to get money. He had been but a short time at this trade before he committed the fact for which he died. Islington was the road where he generally took a purse, and therefore endeavored to make himself perfectly acquainted with the many ways that led to that small town, which he affected so well that he escaped several times from the strictest pursuits. At last it came into his head that the safest way would be to rob women, which accordingly he put into practice and committed abundance of thefts that way for the space of six weeks, particularly on one Mrs. Jane Vickery of a gold ring value twenty shillings, and soon after of Mrs. Elizabeth Barker of a gold ring set with garnets. Being apprehended for these two facts, he was committed to new prison, where either refusing or not being able to make discoveries, he remained in custody till the sessions at the Old Bailey. There, the persons swearing positively to his face, he was, after a trivial defense, convicted, and received sentence of death accordingly. As he had no relations that he knew of, nor so much as one friend in the world, the thoughts of a pardon never distracted his mind a moment. He applied himself from the day of his sentence to a new preparation for death, and having in the midst of all his troubles accustomed himself to reading, he was of great use to his unhappy companions in reading the scripture, and assisting them in their private devotions. He made a just use of that space which the mercy of the English law allows to persons who are to suffer death for their crimes, to make peace with their creator. There was but one person who visited this offender while under the sentence of the law, and he, thinking that the only method by which he could do him service was to save his life, proposed to him a very probable method of escaping, which, for reasons not hard to be guessed at, I shall forbear describing. He pressed him so often, and made the practicability of the thing so plain, that the criminal at last condescended to make the experiment, and his friend promised the next day to bring him the materials for his escape. That night, Ward, who began then to be weak in his limbs with the sickness which had laid upon him ever since he had been in the prison, fell into a deep sleep, a comfort he had not felt since the coming on of his misfortunes. In this space he dreamt that he was in a very barren, sandy place which was bounded before him by a large, deep river, which in the middle of the plain parted itself into two streams that, after having run a considerable space, united again, having formed an island within the branches. 
on the other side of the main river there appeared one of the most beautiful countries that could be thought of covered with trees full of ripe fruit and adorned with flowers on the other side in the island which was enclosed having a large arm of water running behind it and another smaller before the soil appeared sandy and barren like that whereon he stood while he was musing at this sight he beheld a person of grave and venerable aspect in garb and appearance like a shepherd who asked him twice or thrice if he knew the meaning of what he there saw to which he answered no well then says the stranger i will inform you this sight which you see is just your present case you have nothing to resolve with yourself but whether you will prepare by swimming across this river immediately forever to possess that beautiful country that lies before you or by attempting the passage over the narrow board which crosses the first arm of the river and leads into the island where you will be again amidst briars and thorns and must at last pass that deep water before you can enter the pleasant country you behold on the other side this vision made so strong an impression on the poor man's spirits that when his friend came he refused absolutely to make his escape but suffered with great marks of calmness and true repentance at tyburn in the twenty-seventh year of his age end of section seventy four recording by colleen mcmahon Section 75 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon lives of the most remarkable criminals who have been condemned and executed volume one edited by arthur l hayward the life of james white a thief stupidity however it may arise whether from a natural imperfection of the rational faculties or from want of education or from drowning it wholly in bestial and sensual pleasures is doubtless one of the highest misfortunes which can befall any man whatsoever for it not only leaves him little better than the beasts which perish exposed to a thousand inconveniences against which there is no guard but that of a clear and unbiased reason but it renders him also base and abject when under misfortunes the sport and contempt of that wicked and debauched part of the human species who are apt to scoff at despairing misery and to add by their insults to the miseries of those who sink under their load already james white who is to be the subject of the following narration was the son of very honest and reputable parents though their circumstances were so mean as not to afford wherewith to put their son to school and they themselves were so careless as not to procure his admission into the charity school by all which it happened that the poor fellow knew hardly anything better than the beasts of the field and addicted himself like them to filling his belly and satisfying his lust Whenever, therefore, either of those brutish appetites called, he never scrupled plundering to obtain what might supply the first, or using force that might oblige women to submit against their wills unto the other. While he was a mere boy, and worked about as he could with anybody who would employ him, he found a way to steal and carry off thirty pounds weight of tobacco, the property of Mr. Perry, an eminent Virginian merchant, for which he was at the ensuing assizes at the Old Bailey, tried and convicted and thereupon ordered for transportation and in pursuance of that sentence sent on board the transport vessel accordingly their allowance there was very poor such as the miserable wretches could hardly subsist on viz a pint and a half of fresh water and a very small piece of salt meat per diem each but that wherein their greatest misery consisted was the hole in which they were locked underneath the deck where they were tied two and two in order to prevent those dangers which the ship's crew often runs by the attempts made by felons to escape in this disconsolate condition he passed his time until the arrival of the ship in america where he met with a piece of good luck if attaining liberty may be called good luck without acquiring at the same time a means to preserve life in any comfort it happened thus the supercargo falling sick under the usual distemper which visits strangers at first coming if they keep not to the exact rules of temperance and forbearance of strong liquors ran quickly so much in debt with his physician that he was obliged immediately to go off by doing which six felons became their own masters of whom james white was one 
He retired into the woods and lived there in a very wretched manner for some time, till he met with some Indian families in that retreat, who, according to the natural uncultivated humanity of that people, cherished and relieved him to the utmost of their power. Soon after this he went to work amongst some English servants, in order to ease them, telling them how things stood with him, viz. that he had been transported, and that for fear of being seized he fled into the woods where he had endured the greatest hardships. The servants, pitying his desperate condition, relieved him often, without the knowledge of their mistress, until they got him into a planter's service, where though he worked hard he was sure to fare tolerably well. But at length being ordered to carry water in large vessels over the rocks to the ship that rode in the bay underneath it, his feet were thereby so intolerably cut that he was soon rendered lame and incapable of doing it any longer. The family thereupon grew weary of keeping him in that decrepit state he was in, and so, for what servile scullion-like labor he was able to do, a master of a ship took him on board and carried him to England. On his return hither he went directly to his friends in Cripplegate Parish and told them what had befallen him, and how he was driven home again almost as much by force as he was hurried abroad. They were too poor to be able to conceal him, and he was therefore obliged to go out and cry fruit about the streets publicly, that he might not want bread. He went on in this mean but honest way, without committing any new acts that I am able to learn, for the space of some months, then being seen and known by some who were at that employed, or at least employed themselves, in detecting and taking up all such persons as returned from transportation, White amongst the rest was seized, and the ensuing sessions at the Old Bailey convicted on the statute. He pleaded that he was only a very young man, and if the court would have so much pity on him as to send him over again, he would be satisfied to stay all his lifetime in America. But the resolution which had been taken to spare none who returned back into England, because such persons were more bloody and dangerous rogues than any other, and when prompted by despair, apt to resist the officers of justice, took place, and he was put into the death warrant. Both before and after receiving sentence, he not only abandoned himself to stupid, heedless indolence, but behaved in so rude and troublesome a manner as occasioned his being complained of by those miserable wretches who were under the same condemnation, as a greater grievance to them than all their other misfortunes put together. He would sometimes threaten women who came into the hold to visit modestly, tease them with obscene discourse, and after his being prisoner there, committed acts of lewdness to the amazement and horror of the most wicked and abandoned wretches in that dreadful place. Being, however, severely reprimanded for continuing so beastly a course of life, when life itself was so near being extinguished, he laid the crime to his own ignorance, and said that if he were better instructed he would behave better but he could not bear being abused, threatened, and even maltreated by those who were in the same state with himself. From this time he addicted himself to attend more carefully to religious discourses than most of the rest, and as far as the amazing dullness of his intellects would give him leave, applied to the duties of his sad state. Before his death he gave many testimonies of a sincere and unaffected sorrow for his crimes, but as he had not the least notion of the nature, efficacy, or preparation necessary for the sacrament, it was not given him as is usually done to malefactors the day of their death. At the place of execution he seemed surprised and astonished, looked wildly round upon the people, and then asking the minister who attended him what he must do now, the person spoke to instructed him. So shutting his hands close, he cried out with great vehemence, Lord, receive my soul. His age was about twenty-five at the time he suffered, which was on the sixth day of November, 1723. End of section 75 Recording by Colleen McMahon Section 76 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed For Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed. Volume 1. Edited by Arthur L. Hayward. The Life of Joseph Middleton, Housebreaker and Thief. 
amongst the numbers of unhappy wretches who perish at the gallows most pity seems due to those who pressed by want and necessity commit in the bitter exigence of starving some illegal act purely to support life but this is a very scarce case and such a one as i cannot in strictness presume to say that i have hitherto met with in all the loads of papers i have turned over to this purpose though as the best motive to excite compassion and consequently to obtain mercy it is made very often a pretense joseph middleton was the son of a very poor though honest laboring man in the county of kent near deptford who did all that was in his power to bring up his children this unfortunate son was taken off his hand by an uncle a gardener who brought up the boy to his own business and consequently to labor hard enough which would to an understanding person appear no such very great hardship where a man had continually been inured to it even from this cradle and had neither a capacity nor the least probability of attaining anything better yet such an intolerable thing did it seem to middleton that he resolved at any cost to be rid of it and to purchase an easier way of spending his days in order to do this he very wisely chose to go aboard a man of war then bound for the baltic he was in himself a stupid clumsy fellow and the officers and seamen in the ship treated him so harshly the fatigue he went through was so great and the coldness of the climate so pinching to him that he who was so impatiently waited to be rid of the country work now wished as earnestly to return thereto therefore when on the return of sir john norris the ship he was in was paid off and discharged he was in an ecstasy of joy thereat and immediately went down again to settle hard to labor as he had done before experience having convinced him that there were many more hardships sustained in one short ramble than in a staid though laborious life in order as is the common phrase to settle in the world he married a poor woman by whom he had two children and thereby made her as unhappy as himself what he was able to earn by his hands falling much short of what was necessary to keep house in the way he lived this reduced him to such narrowness of circumstances that he was obliged as he would have it believed to take illegal methods for support his own blockish and dastardly temper as it had prevented his ever doing good in an honest way so it as effectually put it out of his power to acquire anything considerable by the rapine he committed for as he wanted spirit to go into a place where there was immediate danger so his companions who did the act while he scouted about to see if anybody was coming and to give them notice when they divided the booty gave him just what they thought fit and keep the rest to themselves he had gone on in this miserable way for a considerable space and yet was able to acquire very little his wants being very near as great while he robbed every night as they were when he labored every day so that in the exchange he got nothing but danger into the bargain at last he was apprehended for breaking into the house of john de pay and joseph gomeroon and taking their jewels and other things to a great value though his innocence in not entering the place would sufficiently excuse him for he pleaded at his trial that he was so far from breaking the house that he was not so much as on the ground of the prosecutor when it was broke but on the contrary as appeared by their own evidence on the other side of the way but it being very fully proved by the evidence that joseph middleton belonged to the gang that he waited there only to give them an intelligence and shared in the money they took the jury found him guilty while he lay under conviction he did his utmost to understand what was necessary for him to do in order to salvation he applied himself with the utmost diligence to praying god to instruct him and enlighten his understanding that he might be able to improve by his sufferings and reap a benefit from the chastisements of his maker in this frame of mind he continued with great steadiness and calmness till the time of his execution at which he showed some fear and confusion as the sight of such a death is apt to create even in the stoutest and best prepared breast this joseph middleton at the time of his exit was in about the fortieth year of his age end of section seventy six
Section 77 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed, Volume 1, edited by Arthur L. Hayward. The Life of John Price, a Housebreaker A prolific life naturally terminates in misery, and, according unto the vices which it has most pursued, so are its punishments suited unto it. Drunkenness besows the understanding, ruins the constitution, and leaves those addicted to it in the last stages of life, in want and misery, equally destitute of all necessaries and incapable to procure them. Lewdness and lust after loose women invenerate both the vigor of the brain and strength of the body, induce weaknesses that anticipate old age, and afflict the declining sinner with so many evils as makes him a burden to himself and a spectacle to others. But if, for the support of all these, men fall into rapacious and wicked courses, plundering others who have frugally provided for the supply of life in order to indulge their own wicked inclinations, then indeed the law of society interposes generally before the law of nature and cuts off with a sudden and ignominious death those who would otherwise probably have fallen by the fruits of their own sins. This malefactor, John Price, was one of those wretched people who act as if they thought life was given them only to commit wickedness and satiate their several appetites with gross impurities, without considering how far they offend either against the institutions of God or the laws of the land. It does not appear that this fellow ever followed any employment that looked like honesty except when he was at sea. The terrors of a sick bed alarmed even a conscience so hardened as prices, and the effects of an ill-spent life appeared so plainly in the weak condition he found himself in that he made, as he afterwards owned, the most solemn vows of amendment, if through the favor of providence he recovered his former health. To this he was by the goodness of God restored but the resolutions he made on that condition were totally forgotten. As soon as he returned home, he sought afresh the company of those loose women and those abandoned wretches who, by the inconveniences into which they had formerly led him, had obliged him to seek for shelter by a long voyage at sea. What little money he had received when the ship was paid off was quickly lavished away so that on the 11th of August, 1725, he, with two others named Cliff and Sparks, undertook, after having well weighed the attempt, to enter the house of the Duke of Leeds by moving the sash, and so plunder it of what was to be got. By their assistance, Cliff got in the window, and afterwards handed out a cloak, hat, and other things to his companions Sparks and Price, but they were all immediately apprehended. Cliff made an information by what he discovered the whole fact, and it was fully proved by Mr. Beelan that Price, when first apprehended, owned that he had been with Cliff and Sparks. Upon the whole, the jury found him guilty, upon which he freely acknowledged the justice of their verdict at the bar. All the time he lay under conviction, he behaved himself as a person convinced of his own unworthiness of life and therefore repined not at the justice of that sentence which condemned him to death, though in his behavior before the trial there had appeared much of that rough and boisterous disposition usual in fellows of no education, who have long practiced such ways of living. Yet long before his death he laid aside all that ferocity of mind, appearing calm and easy under the weight of his sufferings and so much dissatisfied with the trouble he had met with in the world that he appeared scarce desirous of remaining in it. He was not able himself to give any account of his age, but as far as could be guessed from his looks, he might be about thirty when executed. 
which was at the same time with the malefactor last mentioned. Cliff, whose information had hanged him, being reprieved. A fuller account of this rouge will be found on page 276. End of section 77. End of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining, or Other Offenses, Volume 1, by Arthur L. Hayward.